So are guns the problem? I mean, because every time I go on Twitter, every time that there is a shooting that takes place, I'm constantly told by those who would advocate for more gun control that guns are, in fact, the problem. That's the only issue here. If only we would have common sense gun control, if we would ban certain guns, if only we would ban certain sites of magazines, this would go away. And the second thing I usually hear for them is that the ar- the arguments that those of us who make that defend private gun ownership relying on the second amendment or here in Virginia, article one, section 13 of the Virginia constitution. What we're constantly told is that we misunderstand what the founders actually intended and that we're only cherry picking the language that we want out of the second amendment in order to uh, justify our owning of weapons of war. So what we're going to go on today is we're going to analyze some of these claims. We're going to ask the question, do we misunderstand what the second amendment actually says and what the intent is? Do we not fully appreciate uh, the safety that we could all realize if only we banned or say heavily restricted access to firearms. And then finally, we're going to go through some of the most common arguments that are used point by point, the things that you see on Twitter, the things you see all over social media, the things you see all over the news. And we're going to analyze each one of these accusations and we're going to determine if there's any merit or not. So that is what we're going to do today on making the argument powered by Good Ranchers. After Tuesday's episode, there was a great conversation started about the friend zone. And I'm certain today that we'll also have a great conversation in our community chat about today's episode too. So if you haven't already signed up, go down to the link in the description, join our community chat. We're going to have a great conversation there and we'd love to get to know you. All right. As always, I am your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, but other than that, a reasonably good person. Also with us today, my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. And uh, Christian, oh, Hamilton Try one more time. had me muted. He doesn't want you all to hear from me today. Wow. Apparently. Wow. <laughs> Hello, Hamilton. everyone. I know. Not the good <laughs> Hamilton today. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, Christian, not with us here today. He will be back next week. Don't worry. We're all, uh, again, very, very proud of Christian for getting his master's, completing his master's degree uh, in history. And he is, he is over there in uh, the UK right now, uh, receiving that degree and uh, spending some uh, well-earned downtime with, with family. Uh, and then, of course, we have our producer of producers. But uh, I don't know. After muting tina yeah maybe maybe not it's maybe okay. not sometimes i deserve it yeah just... we have uh hamilton the good hamilton the one who I doesn't so. like central I think banking so. okay yep. good okay <laughs> all right well listen hey first things first i want to recognize that today um today is let me see if i got my dates right uh today is december 7th and um so this is Pearl Harbor Day in the United States, and it's the day that we recognize all the lives that were lost and the people that fought on behalf of the United States uh, during the uh, surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, that was actually my, my grandfather was not at Pearl Harbor. He was uh, 16, I believe, when it took place, and he actually enlisted in the Navy shortly after that at, at 16 wow. um, as a result of that attack. We, we were stationed in Hawaii for a while, and I'll tell you what, if you've never... Um, you know, people think of Hawaii, they think beautiful sandy beaches, they think luau's, they think a lot of other things that are are all wonderful reasons to go to Hawaii and appreciate the the weather and the culture and the uh, and the geography. But if you're over there, I would highly encourage you uh, to make sure that Pearl Harbor is on that list because when you go and visit the Arizona, when you stand on the uh, uh, the gun deck of the Missouri, it it is it is a very um, just awe inspiring place. And so we want to recognize all the people that fought there that were lost there. Um, and recognize all the people who were affected by it. Um, okay, today we're going to be talking about the Second Amendment. And the first question that we, we have to ask, the first thing we have to define is, what does the Second Amendment actually say? All right, so we've got a, we've got a link right here. Just so you all know, I'm not, I'm not cooking the books. We're going to go ahead and bring that, that link up. Um, but the, the, the Constitution, the Second Amendment says, very simply, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay. Now, a lot of people will look at that, and if, if you haven't done a lot of research um, or, or reading with respect to the way language develops over time, the way that um, things were discussed at that particular moment in time, you can come to a lot of conclusions about what the Second Amendment was actually designed to protect. Now, we have recent Supreme Court decisions, uh, you know, the Heller decision, among others, that have essentially confirmed that this does actually convey an individual right to firearms. 
However, a lot of people will look at this, and this will be one of the arguments that we talk about later, but I just want to make sure that we, we address this right now. A lot of people will look at this, and, and let's say they are well-intentioned. They don't necessarily fall um, you know, very hard on one side or the other on this issue, but they look at this and say, well, this seems to be applying to a militia. It seems that the, that the federal government is talking about a militia here, and, and that's why uh, you know, your, your right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And, and the, the answer to that is, is important. Um, because you need to break down the Second Amendment, it, it, at the very least, into two components, right? Two, two aspects here. So it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So why did they put in the first part? Why didn't they just say the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? Why, why, why didn't they just say that? Wouldn't that... What if, if they had worded it that way, wouldn't that make a, a far more clear and concise argument for individual firearm ownership? Isn't the fact that they added a well-regulated militia, doesn't that mean that really this was only supposed to apply uh, to those who are members of the militia? And the answer to that is no. But here's why. If you look at a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the first thing that you need to ask yourselves is why would they have put that in there? And when you start to read uh, Madison, when you start to read George Mason, when you start to read the Federalist Papers, when you start to read um, the, the constitutional debates that were taking place around this particular issue, you need to understand that the founders were not just coming off of their own experience with respect to recently fighting the Revolutionary War, um, overcoming the British Empire, which you know, again, at that point just seemed ridiculous, seemed absurd that they would be able to beat one of the most powerful armies in the world and certainly the most powerful military in the world at that particular point. And there was that component, but there was also reading of what happened with other, we'll say free societies or other republics throughout history. One of the things that Madison and again, I, I have the honor of representing Madison's district in the Virginia House of Delegates. One of the things that he was concerned about, and several other uh, members, uh, founders were concerned about, was this idea of mercenary armies or standing armies. And so the concern was is that when a government has a standing army, it, it, it tends to do two things. One, politicians start looking for an excuse to use the standing army. Right, and that could mean in in foreign invasions, foreign wars. It could also mean as a tool in, in order to keep their own populations docile or compliant with the law. And so there was right off the bat a a significant concern about standing armies as well as mercenaries. And this is actually something that if you read Machiavelli, he talks a lot about this. Madison spent so much time just in his in his in his private library at Montpelier. Um, in, in Orange County, Virginia, going through this and, and looking at what were the dangers with respect to standing armies or heavily relying on mercenary forces. And, and again, just so we're all in the same sheet of music, when we're talking about a mercenary force, we're not just talking about somebody that gets paid to be a soldier, right? The, the, the traditional idea of a mercenary uh, contingent was oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes foreign troops so you, you had everything from the Balearic slingers in, in antiquity. You have Cretan archers. You had Swiss pikemen. Um, you, you had you know, crossbowmen. Like, so you, you have this long history of particular regions and soldiers within particular regions, before, oftentimes before there were standing armies, that developed a certain degree of capability around a weapon system or a certain degree of martial prowess and reputation. And when their country wasn't at war, individual units would offer up their services to fight as mercenaries for other countries. So a, a lot of the, the discussion about mercenaries, especially in Machiavelli and, and other texts uh, with respect to the founders, is concerned about the over-reliance on foreign soldiers to defend your state, right? And, and we even saw this with Hessian mercenaries fighting in the American Revolution. Um, so I, I, don't want to, I don't want to confuse this idea between a paid soldier, right? Because our, obviously we, we do have a standing military and we have a professional military, which means they get paid, and, and a mercenary, which essentially can be a unit which, you know, just sells its services uh, maybe sometimes to the highest bidder. Maybe other times they only sell it to you know certain entities. Not not every mercenary is this picture of bloodthirsty you know soldiers of fortune going around shooting you know whoever they're paid to shoot. Right. That's that's kind of a um, that's not an accurate picture of all mercenary elements. But the reason why it was such a concern is because mercenary troops oftentimes at some point 
uh, either maybe sometimes they didn't get paid, maybe sometimes they didn't get paid what they thought they were owed, or maybe they realized that the element or the entity that they were protecting had a lot of money, but not a lot of guns of their own. And so the mercenaries got the bright idea that, hey, why are we not running this place? <laughs> Right? So there was a concern with, with mercenaries. There was also, the, again, the concern with standing armies because governments can still use their standing armies to abuse their citizens. This became uh, a major uh, source of concern with the Roman, especially the late Roman Empire, where a lot of times Roman legions were more loyal toward the generals or the officers commanding that legion than they were to the state itself. And so those standing armies would have an incentive to stage coups in order to put their own generals in charge because it would usually mean large benefits or donatives or land grants to them. Right. So that was part of the concern with standing armies. Now, a lot of times Americans will look at this today and be like, well, this is absurd. This is stupid. This would never happen today. All right. Well, first of all, just keep in mind, this was the very beginning of our country and it had happened quite a bit throughout history. Secondly, I always think it's a little bit arrogant for people to assume that simply because it hasn't happened in a long time or you don't have a history of happening within your own country, that it's impossible that it could ever happen. Right. Certain circumstances can always coalesce in order to create the right conditions for bad things to happen, things that you might not even think would happen. So right off the bat, Concern for standing armies, concern for mercenary troops or being overly reliant on mercenary troops for the security of the state. So why did they put a well-regulated militia being necessary? Because they, they believed and they, they went back to the early days of the Roman Republic. If you look at the way that the early Roman Republic worked, it, it wasn't the, the poorest people that were actually members of the military, right? It, it wasn't like they just went out into the, the streets and just, you know, slapped everybody up or, or released everybody from prison and, and put them into the army to, to serve in the military in, in the early Roman Republic was considered to be a duty and responsibility of the citizenry. And, and the wealthier you were, the greater the responsibility you had for the supply of your own weapons and equipment, like the equites, which was their cavalry force. These were generally the, the wealthier members. Um, and, and so there was this idea that in order to build um, a, a, a military force that was dedicated toward the security of a free state, right? You needed the citizenry. It needed to be made up of the citizenry. So how do you have a competent military capable of, of securing a free state without allowing for either a standing army or over-reliance on mercenaries, which could then be used to oppress the people or uh, to, to carry out, you know, tyrannical order, right? Whatever it is. And the answer was the well-regulated militia. It was the citizenry. So doesn't this, doesn't this feed into this narrative that the Second Amendment really is about the militia? And the answer to that is, once again, no. And the reason why is because you have to understand what the militia was. The militia was not the National Guard. Um, a well-regulated militia was important because you needed, uh, you needed a militia force that were not professional soldiers, but were still drilled and, and still studied war and still uh, engaged in training so that if they were called up to engage in military action, they would be competent in the field. This, this was a big source of concern with respect to the Continental Army and militia forces when they went up against British regulars, right? It really wasn't until later on in the war where militia forces were actually used very effectively. And the Continental Army, which at that point was the standing army, still maintained that that was kind of like the ideal professional force. And militia, militias a lot of times served reconnaissance purposes, or they would serve ancillary purposes, but they weren't considered the, the mainstay of the revolution, Right. But later on, again, you had people like Daniel Morgan and whatnot that knew how to effectively use uh, militia forces. You had Francis Marion, or also known as the Swamp Fox in South Carolina, that understood the proper use of militia. So the well regulated part was the understanding that, yes, we want the militia to be properly drilled, properly ordered, so that they can conduct effective military operations. But this just begs the question who is the militia? Right. And there's, a, there's this excellent quote by George Mason. I'm going to read this off real quick, um, where uh, he said, I asked, sir, what is the militia? It is the whole people except for a few public officials. And, and you, you see this all throughout U.S. history. The militia was always considered to be able-bodied men, usually between the ages of anywhere from like 14 or 16 to you know, the late 40s or even beyond that. But the idea was that the militia were private citizens. They weren't professional soldiers. They were private citizens who were armed, who could pick up their arms at any point in order to fulfill their militia obligations. So 
understand it, it wasn't by accident that they put in that second part where it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's because there is, there's two concerns that the founders were actually addressing. One was the idea of free people being able to come together in the form of a militia to be able to defend a free state. And that the only way you could do that is if individual citizens, if those same free people were armed with their own ability to be able to not just protect themselves, not just to protect their property, not just to protect their country, but to also protect themselves from their government should that government ever become tyrannical. And you say this now and people act as if this is just absurdity. Like, do you really think? Those, they'll make one of two claims. The first claim is, do you really think that our, our own government is going to oppress our people to such a degree? Yes, I think, our, I think a, a government, no matter where they are, no matter what the mechanisms are for selecting the members of that government, I absolutely think that under the right conditions, they would oppress people. I mean, we, we, got, a, we got a glimpse of it during COVID. We got a glimpse of it. Now, I'm not comparing that sort of oppression to what you see in other parts of the world, but did anybody here honestly believe that they would watch governments summarily come in and say, if you don't wear a mask or get a vaccine, you can't do this. We're going to shut down your business and you're not allowed to operate. We're going to shut down your schools. We're not going to allow you to go to church and we will use law enforcement and, and the threat of violence to prevent you from doing so. Did anybody think that was possible? I, I didn't think that was something that would happen, but it did. And so the question you have to ask yourselves is, okay, what additional conditions would be necessary in order to take it to a different level? So yes, it, it is not unreasonable. It certainly wasn't unreasonable then, and it's not unreasonable now for people to say that, yes, people should be able to be armed, to be able to serve as a, a, a um, backstop or as a, uh, as a force to be able to defend themselves against tyranny pushed upon them from their own government or oppression pushed upon them from their own government. The other thing that you'll often hear is like, well, do you honestly think a bunch of civilians with you know, semi-automatic rifles are going to be able to take on the most powerful military in the world? I don't know. Ask the Taliban, right? Ask the Taliban. The most powerful military in the world went over to Afghanistan, fought a 20 year war, kicked the living crap out of them, right? For, for two decades, kicked the living crap out of them, won every single major engagement. And then 20 years later, we left and, and who was in charge of Afghanistan? The Taliban was. Now, am, am I comparing American citizens with firearms? No. What I'm saying is, is that this, this false belief that simply because a military has greater weaponry or, or offensive capacity, that therefore nobody should even try because it's, it's impossible to win. I'm sorry. That's not accurate. And it's that's also not, why we should all have tanks <laughs> and flamethrowers and uh, you know, jets. That. But the, the, the point is, is it's this idea that um, because the United States, and, and again, I thought, it was, I thought it was very interesting that Joe Biden was arrogant enough to get up there and say, you really think you'd take on the U.S. military? You need, you need F-15s, man. Hey, man, like, really? Because didn't you suddenly pull us out of Afghanistan and leave billions of dollars of sophisticated military equipment into the hands of a terrorist organization? Hey, man, did you do that? Okay, well then, Save me your analysis of what's actually required to fight back against a sophisticated military, because you certainly demonstrated that it wasn't necessary to have all that sort of gear in order to win. I also think it's interesting because a lot of times uh, you'll hear people be like, oh, see, it says well regulated. That means regulating guns. We're supposed to regulate guns. And what they miss is that, no, it's the militia that's supposed to be regulated, not the guns. Yeah. No, it, it really is. So understand there's two parts there. There was the, and, and again, you don't just see this in the second amendment. You also see this with an understanding of the debates that took place with respect to the constitution, the bill of rights. And, and you see this, this common thread coming up over and over again, that one of the ways that you actually prevent tyranny. And when they're talking about tyranny, they're not talking about foreign powers. They're talking about domestic tyranny, right? Domestic oppression, a government being oppressive. They always say that one of the, one of the surefire ways that a tyrant will seek to control the population is by disarming them. They say it over and over and over again, right? So no, this, this was clearly a part of their thinking when they put this in place. And unlike a lot of people now, they weren't arrogant or ignorant enough to believe that, well, it couldn't happen now. It couldn't happen today. It couldn't happen in our time, right? So two components to understand that are necessary about the, um, the Second Amendment. One, it absolutely conveys a right to individual gun ownership. And it does so for two principal purposes. One is so that free citizens can take part 
and responsibilities and duties associated with the militia in order to protect a free state and so that they always maintain the capacity to push back against oppression or tyranny, even if it comes from their own government. That is clear. Anybody that is trying to tell you that that, it doesn't say that within the Second Amendment or that was not the philosophy that was influencing the Second Amendment right, is ignorant about the debates that were actually going on in that time. And again, all you have to do is pick up the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers. All you have to do is, is, is pick up the debates over the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And what you're going to see is a common thread amongst all of this where the founders you know, witnessed these very, very two relevant concerns. You, hold on. You mentioned, um, you know, if you want an example, look at COVID, you know, how, how the government overstepped its boundaries and infringed rights in co- during COVID. Yeah. And I just wanted to expand on that real quick because a lot of other countries will talk about how much more civilized they are because they've all given up their guns and, mm-hmm. and they don't need those anymore. And, uh, and, and we're kind of barbarians for still wanting our guns. But if you look at the lockdown situation in those countries, you had m- people being freaking tackled in yeah. parks with their little kids because they were in a public outdoor public place in Australia. And then in uh, in Canada, you had people, you had government officials raiding churches and raiding like a, a hundred year old lady's birthday party because they had more than six people there. You know, that doesn't happen in a, in a society that still ha- is armed. You're not raiding my house yeah. <laughs> for a birthday party because we have eight people there instead of six. You know, so you look at some of these countries and how insane they got during COVID and how prolonged it was. And they had their boot that their, their um, governments had the boot on the neck of their people. And it's like, they don't even see that even during COVID our second amendment, right. Kept us more free. So the, the, the second part, now that we've kind of established what the Constitution says, what the Second Amendment says and why, I want to go into this, this idea of, is it outdated, right? Is it outdated? So the, the second argument, when, when someone finally acknowledges that, okay, yeah, that is what the Second Amendment means, and, you know, and, and okay, I'll concede that point, but it's outdated. It's a problem now. Clearly, we've demonstrated, based off of the, the, the gun-related homicides in the United States versus other countries, that, that now we need to get rid of it because look at all the increased shootings, look at all the problems. Now, one, one of the, the common arguments that I go back to on that one is I, I, you know, I, I mentioned this before. We just, had a, we just had a video go somewhat viral. The shepherdess yeah. interviewed us at the Homesteaders of America conference, and she asked me about gun bans. And, and one of the things I pointed out was is that Americans owning guns, the private ownership of, of firearms, even including semi-automatic, you know, pistols, rifles, is, is a longstanding tradition within the United States. Like essentially as soon as semi-automatics became available, private citizens were owning them. Um, now the question is, is why does it seem to be relatively recently that we see people picking up firearms and going into crowded areas. Now that's not to say that you can't find examples of this taking place, you know, a hundred years ago. And obviously there was, there was massive gang wars that took place with the mob during prohibition and things like that. But I'm talking specifically what we see is a, a higher degree of propensity to be targeting institutions of education, targeting, you know, in these, you know, clubs and stuff like that, where all of a sudden someone will come in with a, usually with a semi-automatic rifle or pistol or combination of the both and, and start shooting people, start shooting children, start shooting people at a, at a concert. And, and the question that I have to ask myself is, okay, well, wait a second. These, the, the means to do all of this existed long before, you know, the nineties, the, the, the means to do all of this and, and to wreak this sort of have existed before, but you didn't see it in anywhere near the same fashion or degree that we're seeing it now. And so I I think it's reasonable for me to look at someone and say, okay, I I believe there's something of a causation correlation problem here. If you're saying the guns are the problem, then I'm going to ask you the very reasonable questions on why they were not the problem before. And if you're going to tell me, well, that doesn't matter that the problem now, so we need to get rid of them. I'm going to say, well, okay, if you get rid of the guns, but you don't actually address the underlying issue for why these attacks are taking place, what you're doing is you're changing out the implement that will be used. You're not actually getting to the root cause of why it's happening. Not to mention the fact that your solution is to say that because this incredibly small group of society has decided to abuse their rights the rights of all citizens are now forfeit. Is that a logical argument? 
Is, is that something that we're, we're willing to accept for the First Amendment? Because this group of people decided to abuse their right to free speech, went into a crowded movie theater, and yelled fire when there was no fire. Now all of your rights to freedom of speech must be reduced, restricted, banned, whatever it might be. Right? Is that, is that the logic that we want to use? Because if it applies to the Second Amendment, well, then arguably it applies to all essential civil liberties which are supposed to be guaranteed to us. And now people will sometimes come back and say, well, no, we're not talking about banning all. We're just talking about restrictions. We already have restrictions. Anybody that's honestly going to tell me, anybody that wants to tell you that we don't have gun restrictions in the United States, what do, do we not have laws against using a firearm illegally? Of course we do. Do, do we not have laws? Do, do we not have background checks? Of course we do. We have all kinds of restrictions. Do, do you think I can go right now, now to Cabela's and just order a machine gun? I can't do that. It'd be nice if we could, though. No, but back <laughs> when there weren't mass shootings, you could get a machine gun. That's the crazy thing is is that you know some a lot of these gun laws are relatively new, and it seems like the more laws they put on, the more you know the more shootings we have. It, it's the laws aren't helping. The laws don't change it. You know, I think that we've just we've had people told for so long that they don't have value, live your own truth, and their truth just happens to be satisfied by going and shooting people up. I mean, anytime you completely take away any moral uh, fiber from the society and you start just totally demolishing the family and then you have for entertainment value, um, you know, kids are sitting there playing video game after video game where they're just shooting people up and they're watching violent shows where people are getting very gory shows where they're just getting mowed down into pink mist. You know, stuff like this does mess with people's heads, especially if they don't have any anything they subscribe to morally above themselves. Well, we had a, uh, and if you could, uh, Hamilton, I, I we have it on our page. There, there was <laughs> probably the, the first time Actually, it was the second time. The second time I ever got in a floor debate, um, which which generated <laughs> generated some public comment. Um, I, I think this speech now, I, I don't know how many times it's been shared, but I, I think it has somewhere in the neighborhood of around 80 million views. And it was a, a floor speech in 2018, and, and it was about this. And one of the things that I was trying to bring up on that was this whole idea of why is this happening? And, and can we can we please get to that question? Instead of just instead of just looking at the implement that is being used, can we ask ourselves the question, why is this happening? And then can we please have a constructive debate and discussion about why it is happening so we can potentially address those issues? Is it predominantly associated with mental health? I'm going to say right now, I, I don't I don't know because I don't know exactly what everybody means when they say mental health. Do, do I obviously think that somebody is is twisted in their thinking if they hurt innocent people like that? Absolutely. But I've seen people who were not suffering from any sort of mental health that we could have effectively analyzed um, do some pretty bad things to pretty innocent people. I saw that in Iraq. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think I could have easily characterized them as a, oh, this is just a cluster B personality set. This is just antisocial behavior. No, that person thought they were fighting for their you know, um, the religion or whatever it was. And, and they thought they could justify that morally justify it by doing horrible things. So I don't think it's just a mental health issue. I think that's become the easy thing to blame it on and the easy thing to justify more government intervention in other areas. And again, I'm not saying that mental health isn't an issue. I think it is, but I think we're actually dealing with something that's far more pernicious. And I, I remember when I was, I had to write a paper um, and it was the whole idea of what was the most difficult moral question. This was, this was a, it was a class on ethics with respect to um, intelligence gathering. And I, and I had to write this paper, and, and it was all about this idea of what, what was the most... Um, biggest threat. The, the, yeah, the biggest threat, the most pressing issue with respect to morality in intelligence gathering. And, and most of my classmates put things down like, well, it's, it's rendition. So re rendition, just to give you an idea, rendition was this idea that we would hand over one of our detainees to a country that didn't have the same laws with respect to torture or interrogation, and we would hand them over to them, 
and then, you know, get the information we wanted. Or it was enhanced interrogation. So was waterboarding really just a form of torture? And, and so these are the questions. And I remember I told my professor, I said, I think it's postmodernism. And, and he, uh, he wrote me back and he goes, what do you mean by that? I said, well, if, if you establish a society where there's no such thing as objective truth or objective morality, and you combine that with Maslow's hierarchy of needs where self-actualization is the most important um, is the most important component of one's existence. I said, then you're, you're going to end I mean, and that's what you're pulling your intelligence, you know, your interrogators and, and your intelligence analysts and whatnot. If you're pulling them from that gene pool, well, then what you're going to end up with is interrogators and intelligence operators who don't have a sense of a you know, strong sense of objective morality, don't have a strong sense of objective truth. And it's all about essentially what either makes you feel good or accomplishes the mission. And so what, what is the objective, what is, what is the objective truth or morality, which prevents them from following bad orders? And, and he, he let me write the paper on that. And later on, he actually offered to, um, see if I wanted to get it published. And I just didn't have the time at, at that point to try you just to just didn't want to get it published. Try to, no, no, that yeah, I didn't I have like a problem. <laughs> I didn't have a problem with getting it published. I didn't have the time, but, but that was part of the argument is that if you're not address, if you're not addressing the moral situation within a society that allows for these things to happen or, or that where, where these things happen to a significant degree, well, then it, you're just addressing the implement. You're not addressing the root cause, and therefore you're, you're not going to fully understand or comprehend what's going on or why. So I, I think we have this. Um, we're not going to play all of it. Yeah, we're going to play some of it, and you guys are going to get to see Beardless Nick. Yeah, this is, this is Beardless, Beardless Nick. But the, Nick. Only, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because, to, to give you an idea, this was right after the Parkland shooting in Florida. And I, I, at that point, I was serving on the Gun Sub 1. Um, I'm currently the subcommittee chairman for that. I, I probably will not be next year. Uh, we have new leadership coming in. But I was, the, I, I was a member of the committee at that point, and I had listened to all the testimony that was coming in with respect to various uh, restrictions on, on gun rights and, and Second Amendment rights and Article 1, Section 13 rights in Virginia. And I had, I had had people, I had had colleagues of mine compare me to Nazis. I'd had um, comrades, or I'd had uh, colleagues of mine tell me that um, I was on the side of terrorists. Um, and then I had another colleague stand up on the House floor and, and compared us all to segregationists um, who were just being intransigent in our way of thinking. So that's a little bit of the backdrop of, of what influenced this speech. But we'll go ahead and play it for you and kind of let you decide. The dog from Culpeper, Dog at Freitas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a point of personal privilege. Dog at the floor. So, over the last several days, Mr. Speaker, there's been a lot of discussion about an open and honest debate with respect to school shootings, gun violence, gun control, etc. And an open and honest debate, as I understand it, is one that would rely on data, facts, evidence, analysis, reason, logic, etc., etc. And I'm certainly willing to have that debate. I think if we were going to look seriously at school shootings and gun control, we would analyze things like, why do all mass shootings seem to take place in gun-free zones? Wouldn't it be reasonable to test whether or not the efficacy of gun-free zones have actually achieved what their intended intent is? We'd start to look at most of these shooters come from broken homes. What sort of government policies have actually encouraged broken homes? You can look at left-leaning think tanks like the Brookings Institute that will actually say that some of it can be attributed to various cultural changes that happened in the 60s to include uh, the abortion industry. You can look at a more conservative-leaning organizations that will say that the welfare state contributed significantly to dismantling the family as families became more and more dependent upon the government than they were mothers and fathers in the home raising children. We could look at various status with those areas within the United States and around the world that have strict gun control measures and what their crime rates look like, whether it's Chicago, New York City, Washington, D.C., and others that have incredibly strict gun laws, and yet for some reason it hasn't seemed to stop the gun violence in those particular areas. We can look at the analysis out of uh, 538, which is considered more of a left of center data analysis think tank where you have several analysts now confirmed through the data that they were looking at, not just in the United States, but in Canada, Great Britain, and Australia, that they were shocked that the data did not support what they thought gun control measures would actually achieve. We can look at the number of cases within the United States where a gun has been used for self-defense. 
Estimates range everywhere from 100,000 uses to over, close to a million uses within the United States. Now, some organizations and some reporters only want to report on the ones where a gun was used and it actually resulted in the death or maiming of the perpetrator. But if you look at the ones where the gun was used and the mere presence of the firearm actually dissuaded a criminal from committing an act of violence, an act of rape, an act of murder, the number shoots up, it skyrockets. So when people on this side talk about the importance of the Second Amendment, please understand it's not just some base philosophical conviction that we all have. It is rooted in the idea that while we may be a post-enlightenment society, the vast majority of horrible atrocities that we've seen have happened in those post-enlightenment societies. It has happened as a result of governments systematically disarming citizens and claiming themselves to be the sole responsible party for their security, and then turning on those same citizens and punishing them. That's the most egregious cases. But in the individual cases of self-defense, that's why the people on this side of the aisle hold the Second Amendment in such high esteem, because we honestly believe that you have an inherent right to defend yourself. And your ability to defend yourself should not be excluded to, to your size. Firearms provide someone that is weaker and not as fast the ability to actually defend themselves from a stronger attacker. Some of the other things that we would look at, and, and some of the things I would hope we would have bipartisan support for, all of us agree that we need to make sure that our students are better protected when they go to schools. One of the things that we would look at is arming certain teachers. Not every teacher, but a teacher that is comfortable with it, is, is former law enforcement, is former military, that is now in the classroom. Delegate Plum said yesterday that that was ridiculous to consider. Why? Is it because the other side of this debate will only accept one quote-unquote solution to this problem, and that is tearing apart or gutting the Second Amendment? And I understand. We're going to mention just a couple of the bills that were, were done this year, right? Background checks, getting rid of bump stocks. If you're wondering the other reason why we can't have an honest debate over this one is because, quite frankly, I don't think any of us on this side of the aisle believe you when you say that's all you want to do. It'll be bump stocks, it'll be background checks, then it'll be different kind of background checks that register the guns. Then after that, it'll be we need to ban assault weapons. What's an assault weapon? Something that looks scary. Then after that, it'll be semi-automatic rifles. After that, it'll be semi-automatic handguns. Then it'll be revolvers, shotguns. Because when the policies fail to produce the results you are promising to your constituents, you'll be back with more reasons on why we've got to infringe on Second Amendment rights. The other reason why it's really difficult to have an honest and open debate about this is because of this, members of this body comparing members on this side of the aisle to Nazis. Members on the other side of the aisle saying that when a 24-year-old teacher gets up and says that the whole debate is between the Second Amendment or her life, that's a false dilemma. And quite frankly, one of the ones that I found the most offensive, along with being compared to Nazis, was being compared to segregationists. I just want to remind everyone, someone, very quickly, it was not our party that supported slavery, that fought women's suffrage, that rounded up tens of thousands of Asian Americans and put them in concentration camps, that supported Jim Crow, that supported segregation, or supported mass resistance. That wasn't our party. That was the Democrat Party. Now, I'm thrilled that Democrats no longer believe that, and I don't believe that a single current member of this body who is a Democrat ever believe those things, but I would really appreciate it if every time you want to make a powerful point, you don't project the sins, the atrocities, and the injustices that you, the Democratic Party perpetrated on others onto us. Pause. So if we want to have an open... So that, that was the point where three of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle left the room in tears. And then they were the, crying on the floor and of the, the entire, And then the entire Democratic caucus requested a 15-minute recess so they can gather their composure. Yeah. And then they came back to the floor and proceeded to take the next two or three days. And somebody in the, in the comments asked, what is a point of personal privilege? In the, in the House of Delegates, when you stand up to speak on an issue that you would like to speak on, it's called a point of personal privilege. And it happens during the morning hour. And for the next three days, I got called a racist. I got called. I, they I had mean, never been thus offended. They though. had never been thus offended. They had never been thus offended, despite the fact that they had been on the floor again, comparing us to segregationists and Nazis because we didn't want to pass their gun restriction bills. But the moment I got up and I said, well, wait a second, wasn't it your party that did all of these things? 
And, and I didn't accuse them directly of it. I said it was their party. But no, 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 that would, they had never been thus offended. But this is, this is another thing I want to talk about. It's this idea that there's this assumed moral high ground if you take the position that you want significantly more gun control or gun bans. If you take that position, well, then you are safe in the knowledge that you are taking the, the moral high ground. I don't believe that at all. I don't think you're taking the moral high ground. I think you're either ignorant um, or you maybe you do have nefarious intentions. I don't know. I won't assign nefarious intentions into you. That won't be my first assumption, but I'm definitely going to assume you're ignorant of certain things, namely history, because honestly, when, when I look at the right to be able to defend oneself, if, if the government acknowledges your right to defend yourself and says, yes, you, you should be able to have certain basic implements or tools in order to be able to, to be able to, to foster that um, defense and somebody misuses it. Well, then the obligation of the government at that point would be to punish the person that misuses it. It would be to tell that person you're no longer allowed to use this implement anymore because you've now used it for nefarious purposes in order to hurt somebody else. But if that same government turns around and goes, oh, well, this bad person used it. So now none of you can use it. Well, then this begs the question, okay, well, now now who is responsible for my security? Well, the government, the police. No, they're not. Go look at Supreme Court decisions on whether or not law enforcement has an obligation to protect you. They don't. And guess what? They're not supposed to because that would be an impossible obligation. Their job is to enforce the law. Now, the vast majority of people that I know in law enforcement would go out of their way to protect you. Who would put themselves in harm's way to protect you. I, I absolutely believe that. I had my father on here for, for two episodes talking about how he did that as a member of LAPD. But it isn't their legal obligation. Nobody, nobody in this country has a legal obligation to defend you unless you have signed some sort of private contract with them. And last time I checked, the average citizen who is struggling to pay for groceries right now can't afford a private security detail. You know who can? The politicians who either get one by virtue of being politicians. We have our own capital police force in Richmond. Or the incredibly wealthy corporate executives, Hollywood execs, starlets, singers that are constantly advocating for gun bans or gun restrictions. But not for their security details, of course, because they're important. They need this protection. You don't. You can rely on a police force or a military, which has no legal obligation to defend or protect you. But they, on the other hand, they're the important people. They're the special people. And so they need this security, but, but you don't. But you don't. But it's easy. If you want this sort of security, fine. Just become rich and famous like them or powerful. And then, then you can have it then you can have it because they're the good people, right? Because that's the morally superior position to take. Yeah, I don't think so. I think another problem that we have that we better start addressing here pretty quickly is why is it, why is it that when a mass shooting takes place and it doesn't fit the media's preferred narrative, we don't get access to the manifestos very quickly, do we? It's almost as like when somebody, when somebody uses an act of violence or they use a firearm to commit an act of violence and it doesn't fit to the media's narrative, all of a sudden we're not entitled to know what their motivation was. Because you would think that anybody that was truly concerned about school shootings or any shooting for that matter would be somewhat concerned about the motivation behind it. But they don't seem to be unless it fits their preferred narrative. And what we're finding out is that very few of them actually do fit their preferred narrative once you get to the motivation of why somebody decided to engage in a shooting. I mean, yeah, they may come out of really with, with a lot of assumptions right off the bat if they think it's going to fit into their narrative, but the moment they find out it doesn't, all of a sudden, it's no longer a primary concern. Let's just focus on the gun. That's it. Focus on the gun. All right. The, the chat would like us to play the rest of the video. Oh, okay. There's not much left, but go ahead. <laughs> One second. Is it going to work? Do that. But it does start with a certain degree of mutual respect. It, it starts with a certain degree of not assuming that the only reason why we believe in the Second Amendment is because the NRA paid us off. Well, if that's the sort of logic you want to use, why don't you go take a look at how much money the NRA spends and how much money Planned Parenthood spends? Because when I get up here and I talk about abortion, I don't assume that you're all bought and paid for by Planned Parenthood. I don't assume you're horrible people. 
because I disagree with you on a policy position. I assume you have deep convictions and that we can have an argument and a debate about it. But if you're not willing to reciprocate that level of respect, well, don't be surprised when it becomes more difficult to talk about these things. Because there is a lot that we can do, and there is a lot that we need to do to ensure the security of our children and our citizens. But yes, we are going to have a problem with, with so-called solutions which infringe on people's liberty under the promise the government will provide for their security. Because ultimately in this last school shooting, we had a perfect example of government being engaged over 30 times and still failing to provide security for those students. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, like I said, that, that, caused, a, that caused a lot of controversy. They, all, they, they <laughs> left crying. You could, like, you'd get in the elevator after that with some of these people and you could cut the hatred with a knife almost. I mean, they hated Nick after that. Like, oh, I, I got called, I, the one that blew my mind was I got called a racist. And I was like, how, how is this racist? And somebody said, well, you mentioned the 1960s. I said, I was talking about abortion and the sexual revolution. I was essentially talking about this idea where all of a sudden, hey, if your kid's an inconvenience, just abort them. Which I mean, technically happened in seventy three, but the sexual revolution that kind of fueled it, and right. the fathers, the, the fatherlessness that would happen. Because I actually had a news reporter come up to me, and goes, "Did you just claim that abortions cause mass shootings?" I said, "No, I didn't say that. What I was talking about but was the father, headlines did. What I was talking about was fatherless homes." I said, go look at the prison system right now. And what you're going to find is between 80 to 90% of the people in yeah. there had no positive male role model in their life growing up. Yeah. And a lot of that was fostered by ideas about sex and family that came out of the sexual revolution of the 60s. What did the headline say? Delegate Freitas claims abortion leads to mass shootings. I mean, the guy blatantly for, lied. For the first, for the first um, like three days after this happened, the media had a field day with it and they were, they basically said that this speech was about something it wasn't about. Yeah. And it wasn't until Nick um, went ahead and put the speech on Facebook and it went absolutely viral that the media had to stop yeah, misquoting and lying about what he said. Well, it's also when I learned the power of social media, because when I put this out there and I watched the press deliberately misrepresent what I said describe it as a screed or a rant or everything. I deliberately misrepresented what I said. And then when I put it out on social media, and again, I think it got upwards of, uh, the, the higher estimates are 100 million views. But it, it went all over the place, and people got a chance to see what I said, not the media's rendition of what I said. You, That's where I you realized. You didn't give that speech to post it on social media either. No, no. And, and you know what's really funny is uh, it was, it, Nick basically had been called a racist and a Nazi like one too many times that day. And I remember him texting me right before he was going to get up and speak. And he goes, I think I'm just going to get up and say something. Well, and he got, so this was not a prepared speech, you guys. The only time he looked down at anything was to check his numbers for 538. Yeah, the, the Brian Betts said, Nick Freitas, they call you racist because when you talk about broken fatherless homes, they assume you're referring to a specific group of people. Brian, you are absolutely that right. That's exactly right. And why. here's what was fascinating. I grew up in a home where my parents were divorced. And so it was fine. I had to, I had one one gentleman, one gentleman from the other side of the aisle who I who I, I respect came over to me and said, Nick, can we talk about what happened? And he goes, when you say the 60s, he goes, we hear, he was a member of the Black Caucus. He goes, we hear civil rights movement. I said, I said, Luke, there's no way I could have meant that in anything else I was saying. And he goes, I, I understand. I said, but I want you to know that a lot of times when you reference that time period, that's what it, that's what we think about. I said, I appreciate you telling me that Luke, I will take that under consideration because my intent was not to, to address that. It was this. And he goes, and, and I can't remember if he said this to somebody goes, I had another friend goes, well, they're mad at you because you brought up fatherless homes. I'm like, my dad and mom got divorced when I was three. My dad lived in LA. I lived in Northern California. I got to see him three months out of the year. I said, I got a question, Greg. Am I allowed to talk about my own personal experiences in life? Or is that off limits because the other side of the aisle doesn't think I'm the right color for it? Like that just pissed me off. Yeah. The fact that they thought it was about fatherless homes to begin with, um, fatherless homes specifically meant uh, a certain race to begin with is racist. They automatically thought. They, like a, a certain race popped in their head. Yeah. That's racist. Well, let, let's go, let's go back to this whole idea because, um, I, I want to get into some of the common arguments uh, against guns that we hear all the time that I want to, I want to kind of equip people for with, with what I think are, are legitimate answers to those accusations. But the, I want to wrap this up, um, 
Because again, this, this point that I brought up earlier that I think is very, very important for people to understand the police do not have an obligation to protect you. They do not have a legal obligation to do that because it would be impossible to legally require that. Because then anytime you got hurt, you could claim that the police failed to protect you. But one of the reasons why we've argued for private gun ownership is because we understand that's the reality, right? The military, not legally obligated to protect you. They're supposed to uphold and support the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Nothing in there about having to legally require to protect you. And, and this, is, this is a basic understanding about what it means to be in a free society. And that is the government doesn't have an obligation to provide for you. Right? There's, there's certain services that they're supposed to provide as, as a result of collecting taxes. But it usually never conveys into some sort of like, oh, they got to provide for your safety because that would be impossible to do. They got to provide for your food because that would be impossible to do. But you know who can help you provide for yourself and your food is Good Ranchers. That's right. That's right. It is that time in the show to be able to do our Good Ranchers ad and to make you aware that if you use promo code Nick, and you get one of these subscriptions, you're going to get a free 90, was a $99 ham? Yes. And, and I'm telling you, man, like for anybody that's thinking, what are you talking about? I can go to the store and get a ham for 20 bucks. It ain't the, dude, we are not talking about the same ham. We are just not talking about the same thing. I, and again, I got a, I got a glimpse of this once years ago when I, and I got a good Virginia, you know, smoked ham here and it cost a lot of money. I was like, oh my gosh, this is really expensive. Nope. It was, it was so worth the money. So I'm telling you right now, promo code Nick, you sign on, you go to goodranchers.com, promo code Nick, you sign up for that, you get a subscription, you're going to get a, you're going to get a discount, you're going to get that free ham, you're going to get free shipping when you sign up for one of these subscriptions. Um, they also, also have some other, what is it, by, if you get ordered by December 11th. Yes, that is the most important thing. There are four days left. Four days left. To order yeah. and get your ham in time for Christmas. Yeah. So if you're, if you are a Christmas ham family or you're considering being a Christmas ham family, go to Good Ranchers right now, sign up for one of those subscriptions, use promo code Nick. You're going to get quality raised. Again, anything you get there, whether it's beef, whether it's pork, whether it's poultry, whether it's wild caught seafood, it, it's coming right here from America, from American farmers, from American fishermen. It's a, it's a great deal. Promo code Nick, get yourself a discount, get yourself a free ham, get yourself free shipping. All right. Goodranchers.com. Thank you very much for supporting the show by getting yourself some good ranchers. All right, let's go into some of the most common arguments that that I hear all over social media. And some of these I've addressed before, and some of these we've kind of um, addressed in one way or another in, in the discussion that we've had thus far. But I, I really want to hammer these homes because here's, here's one of the ones I hear all the time. The Second Amendment was written for flintlock muskets, right? And this is usually, you idiot, you think the Second Amendment gives you right to an AR-15 or a weapon of war. It was written for flintlocks which I think is funny because at the time this was written, flintlocks were a weapon of war, right? There's this whole differentiation between, oh, that's a weapon of war, but this isn't. I, I got news for you. Semi-automatic rifles, semi-automatic pistols, right? That, that, that is all protected under the Second Amendment. I, I would argue it's even more than that, but for anybody making the argument, as we're going to see later in Virginia, someone's making the argument that a semi-automatic AR-15 is now a weapon of war, and they know because they carried one in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, great. I also went to Iraq. I didn't just carry mine. I actually used it, and I'm telling you right now, th this is a ridiculous argument. Here's why the whole flintlock argument is especially stupid. If you believe that the Second Amendment was only written to protect whatever firearm technology which existed at the time that this went into effect, you would have to then conclude that any technology associated with the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment, well, no, no, no your, your right to privacy or your right to be protected from unlawful search and seizure, nope, that, that only counts if officials are going into your house and taking it. But if they tap your phones, well, I mean, the founders didn't even know what a phone was. So clearly they didn't, clearly they didn't mean to protect that as well. Or, or what about, what about your, your right to um, your, your freedom of speech, right? Well, clearly freedom of speech doesn't cover what you say in an email or on a Twitter post because my gosh, the founders didn't know what Twitter was. So they must have only, they must have only meant speech that you, you verbally communicate or use a quill pen and paper to write down, Right. Is that the sort of interpretation you want in the First Amendment? That, that all, of, all of the rights protected within the Bill of Rights only apply to whatever technology or practices were currently in, in going on in the 18th century. That, that really where you want to go with this? Right? That, that is an on-its-face ridiculous argument. Right? It, it doesn't make any sense. So the moment somebody says, 
the, the Second Amendment was only written for flintlocks. That's where you look back on them and say, well, then I guess the I guess the federal government can now tap your phones for whatever reason they want. I guess the federal government can now regulate whatever you say on social media platforms because after all, after all, the founders didn't know any of that technology was at that time either, right? In fact, anything you use other than a, a quill pen, right? Uh, that that just not protected, yeah, was an 18th century technology. And that's the point where hopefully an, a reasonably honest person will say, okay, I get it. That's not a good argument. All right, what's the- I would al- Hold on. I would also say that the Second Amendment, the way it's written- also negates that argument on its face because it references a well-regulated militia being necessary, which is a form of like being able to, you know, go to war basically. Um, Because it mentions the well-regulated militia, it assumes that the people have weapons of war. Yeah. No, that's, that's an excellent point because if, if the, if the citizenry doesn't actually have a, a weapon system that would be sufficient, let, let's just, let, let's put it in its most moderate terms to at least be able to engage in light infantry operations, right? Cause that's, that's generally what militias were. They were, they were generally light infantry, but you also had artillery and, and everything else. Well, then if, if they don't have those weapon systems, well, then they can't be members of the militia. And again, the national guard did not replace the militia. Please keep that in mind. The National Guard is not a replacement for the militia. The National Guard is primarily financed by the federal government, and the president can essentially federalize the National Guard kind of whenever they feel like it. At least that's been the practice. Yeah. Right? There, there's actually bills going on called Defend Our Guard Act, which says that unless the United States military has declared war, the National Guard unit should not be able to be called up and sent overseas. But do you want to know why most state legislatures don't want to do it? Because they'll lose federal funding. Right. So once again, we have the federal government overstepping its boundaries, Mm -hmm. not because it can legally do so based off of its enumerated powers in the Constitution, but because it has the power to tax people and then extort you with your own tax dollars. Yeah, they did the same thing with the vaccine. Yeah. All right. Let's look at this one. This 2A was meant for a well-regulated militia, which is the National Guard. I think we've already addressed this one before that the militia and the National Guard, not the same thing. I kind of just said it now as well. So we've reiterated that. And again, you would not have found a, a, a prominent founding father writing on this topic that would have said that the Continental Army um, or, or that something that would be like the National Guard, which is essentially ultimately largely just a branch of of the United States Army uh, or Navy or Air Force or, or Marine Corps or whatnot, um, that that meets the definition of militia as they understood it and as they articulated it. Uh, the third one, I love this one. You don't need an AR-15 for hunting. Well, cool, cool. That's well, it true. It depends on what you're hunting. That's, that's true. <laughs> you don't need an AR-15 for hunting, right? And if the founders had written the Second Amendment after getting back from an especially hard hunting trip, that would be a relevant argument. <laughs> yes, but since that's not why they wrote it, then it's irrelevant. It's a non sequitur, right? It, it, the Second Amendment was not rented to protect your right to shoot ducks yeah. or deer or anything else. And a lot of Republicans have to be reminded of this too. I will never, every single time there's a Republican on the tra- campaign trail and they have your quintessential duck hunting in the orange jacket yeah. uh, to show that they're pro Second Amendment. I'm going, all you're doing is telling me you're pro hunting. So gross. I, I know plenty of people. <laughs> yeah. I know plenty of people that think hunting is fine and are still anti-gun. Yeah. And a lot of them vote Republican. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a problem and that Republicans s- don't get it also. So many Republican politicians are all for background checks, too. Yeah. yeah. It's a whole nother conversation, Here, though. Here's another one. If you need multiple rounds to hunt, this, this has to do with high-capacity magazines and, and oh. things and some automatic rifles. Mm-hmm. So okay. the way it goes is if you need multiple rounds to hunt, then you suck at hunting. Well, if you need an unarmed citizenry to govern, you suck at governing. Because once again, the Second Amendment is not about hunting. It's about people being able to protect themselves from tyranny and oppression. And I, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have perused a history book anytime soon, but it turns out that government's pretty good at delivering on the oppression. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I had. <laughs> but that also assumes that, that the Second Amendment is just for hunting. Again, it's basically a, a reconfiguration of the same argument. Yeah. Shipbuilding Observer pointed out, because what's funny about the musket argument is that repeating rifles existed back then. The Puckle Gun, 1667, Drum Fed, Crank Fed, and the Catch Off Repeater, 1630s, Side Lever Action, 30 to 60 rounds per minute. He's absolutely right. In fact, I, I may or may not have a Spencer repeating carbine, which was actually in the, that was in the 1860. Um, but yeah, no, there, there was oh, great. Now we're going to get raided by the ATF. 
I'm so glad. Not for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if, if you look at, if you look at all of these, uh, if you look at the actual weapon systems that were available at that time, they meant you could own cannons. <laughs> like there was privately owned cannons How at that cool time. How would that be? Yeah. <laughs> I want a cannon for my front yard yeah. and I want to know why I can't have it. Baby, you are so hot right now. I got to tell you. <laughs> all right. Next one. Um, Countries with strict gun laws don't have as much gun violence. Okay, here's what's interesting about this. Um, if you if you look at the um, if you look at the rankings by uh, like murder per country, first of all, there are a lot of countries that have higher murder rates and higher degrees of gun violence than the United States, which don't have which also have strict gun laws, right? So it's not it's not a causation correlation. What people are usually referring to there is they'll look at Western European countries. Right. And they'll look at the United States and they say they have fewer gun deaths. All right. If you break down gun deaths within the United States, historically, um, you usually end up with around 30 to 35,000 gun deaths per year, usually between half to two thirds of that, right. Are suicides, right. Which is, which is absolutely tragic, but the United States does not have the highest suicide rate in the world. I think, I, I think of like major countries, I think it's Japan. And it's interesting to me because people point to, well, Japan has very, very strict gun laws and it's very, very nice and it's very, very pleasant. And it's like, it's also a very, you know, homogenous country with a, a dominant culture. <laughs> um, and, and again, some people say, oh, so you're saying diversity leads to more violence. I'm saying it can, it depends on the sort of diversity that you have. And I'm not talking about diversity of skin color. I'm talking about diversity of values and, and culture within a society where when that clashes, sometimes it leads to violence. And I don't think it's crazy to point that out. But what you're seeing in, in, in some places around the world is they'll have a high suicide rate. They just don't do it with guns. All right, then when you reduce the, the sort of violence that is taking place with respect to like legitimate homicides, we're not, and people say, what do you mean legitimate homicides? If you break into my house to hurt me and I kill you, that's a legitimate homicide. That's a legitimate homicide, but it still works its way into the gun statistics, right? So that's important to note, right? So when we're talking about murder with a firearm, what you end up finding out is that a vast majority of the murder with firearms takes place within urban areas. And a lot of it is due to gang violence. A lot of it takes place in places like Chicago or New York city, which by the way, have really strict gun laws. Now it also happens in places like Birmingham or new Orleans where the state doesn't have strict gun laws. And sometimes it varies based off of what localities can do versus what the state applies. But once again, it's, it's in large urban areas and a lot of it is usually a result of gang violence, right? So, okay, there, there's a major source of your problem, gang violence. Maybe, maybe we could focus on that because if it, the attitude that you sometimes hear is that, well, Chicago only has a lot of gun violence because people can go to Indiana to get the guns and then come in. Oh, great. So I guess the gun violence in Indiana is through the roof, right? Nope. Okay. So once again, the causation correlation issue is problematic. Yes, if you got rid of all guns tomorrow, there would be less gun violence. That doesn't mean there would be less violence. And what you will have effectively done is told all the people with guns who were breaking no laws is that they're now a target for violence because the bad guys know they don't have any means to defend themselves. There was a reason why robberies in the UK, daytime robberies in the UK went up when they started engaging in massive gun control. One of the reasons, oh, excuse me, um, um, Robberies, not daytime robberies, robberies taking place where the burglar didn't scout out the place first to make sure that the occupants were not home at the time, right? In, in a society where people have guns and you want to go rob them, you're more likely to do it at a time when they're not there. And that's usually daytime. That's right. I, I got that part uh, confused. Daytime. But they will case the place. They'll case the place to make sure that you're not there. Well, if they know you don't have a gun or a means of defending yourself or, or you're a woman home alone and they're a 250 pound man, chances are you aren't winning that fight unless you have a gun. Like I, I've pointed this out before. So look, I'm about 215 pounds. <laughs> Hamilton likes to say 280. I'm about 215, right? And, and I, I had a career in the military and special operations with a gun or without a gun. I can fight. I'm, I'm going to be a lot more effective with a gun Okay. We've also been doing MMA. Yeah. My, my, my wife or my daughters, on the other hand, don't have that training, don't have that experience, are not going to be able to fight like that, but they all know how to shoot. And, and I don't want my wife and I don't want my girls to be afraid to go places because they're incapable of defending themselves. That's why I taught them. You want to talk about strong, independent women. Great. I got two daughters that are pretty strong right now because they know they can go into a situation and handle a gun. 
All right, what's another one here? Um, I think it's also important to point out that the statistics from these other countries may not be accurate or trustworthy. Yeah, it depends. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not accusing. I'm not well, accusing. And they're the, also, they're also um, starting to regulate how many knives you can have and what how big the knives can be in your house. Yeah. So, and because they're having so many more knife attacks, and they also started having a surge of people just taking vans and running them into crowds of people. Yeah. What so, on? I, I mean, so the problem re resides there. There's another <clears throat> Brian Bet said. Uh, oh shoot, it's back up here. Um, Nick, a news article released in 2020 shows 37 percent more gun violence in rural areas than urban. Yeah, I think that was I forget who put that out. Yeah, that's um, the the okay. The problem too is that you need to break down violence mm -hmm. versus. Are we talking about murder? Are we talking about robbery? Are we talking about theft? Right. And then we're also talking about the preponderance where the sick is coming because part of this is a per capita thing. So obviously if one act of gun violence takes place in Culpeper, right, you would require dozens of acts of gun violence in Chicago in, in order to match that from a per capita basis. Yeah. The, the, the real question is, is okay, where is there a major source of, of gun violence, like dominating your streets and dominating your, you know, your, your area? Yeah. Like, are there areas you're afraid to go to yeah, and, because and of gun violence? Well, a lot of it, what they try to do too, is they try to say that, Oh, look, it's the South where you have a higher percentage of gun violence taking place. Okay. But it was the South in Birmingham. It was the yeah. South in new Orleans. It was the South in, in urban areas within Southern uh, states. So that's the part where again it doesn't always prove what they think it proves. But but here's the other here's the other big question that you have to ask yourself. Okay? Living in a society where if you want to live in a free society, we have something called trade-offs, right? Thomas Sowell talks about this all the time. And this is the whole thing of the the issue is the guns. So obviously if you have greater access to guns, yes, you could have a society where you're going to have greater gun violence. The question is is okay, what are you going to do in order to prevent the gun the, the inappropriate gun violence from taking place? Um, and by inappropriate I mean if I use a gun to protect myself, that's not inappropriate gun violence if you pose the threat to me. If the solution is is we're just going to reduce the overall quantity of guns within society. Well then by necessity, you're that is going to impact law-abiding people more than it impacts criminals. Because you're not uninventing guns, so there's still mechanisms where they can get a hold of it. Two, you're not necessarily changing their motivations on what they're going to do, so they're just going to find a different implement to do it if they can't find a gun. Um, and then, again, ultimately, the biggest concern here is you just disarmed everybody and you've taken away their ability to defend themselves. So here's my question. If you're going to take away my ability to defend myself, right, my reasonable ability to defend myself, are you now responsible for my security? If the answer is no, then who is? Well, I guess that's not I guess that's not a source of concern. I guess it's just well, no if if we if we lower the overall gun violence related statistics, that's what matters. Okay, great. So let me tell you how that works out in your world. All right? Woman is being beaten by her boyfriend. She goes out and she gets a gun. Boyfriend shows up to beat her to death and she shoots him. Oh, that's a gun violence statistic. Okay, we ban guns. Boyfriend shows up and beats her to death with his fists. That's also a drop in gun violence statistics. Does that sound like an equitable trade? There's your trade-off. Your trade-off was somebody that wasn't a victim now is a victim or has become a victim of violence or murder that wouldn't have been because you took away their ability to defend themselves. Was that a good trade-off? Because your gun violence statistics look fine. They've improved now, now we can have more domestic violence victims being beaten to death, but as long as it's not done with a gun, I guess we're all happy, right? That's, that was what we were going for, gun violence. Not violence, not the motivations behind it, not the problems with it, just gun violence. Let's get rid of the gun violence. And, and this is the part that bothers me. This is ultimately, this is ultimately a trade-off that we're being told that we have to accept for a safer society. So we're not going to change the motivations of all the people that currently have a firearm that intend to do an act of evil against an innocent person. We're going to make it harder for them to get them. We're going to make it a crime for them to possess them. And we're going to hope they either hand it over, have less access to them, or choose a different implement. But ultimately, they are still capable and still have the desire to commit acts of violence. We will have disarmed all the people that now will not have a capability of defending themselves against somebody like this, right? And we're going to hope that yields a better result because apparently we weren't concerned about what the underlying causes were. And then, and then let's just say, let's just say not probable, 
but certainly possible in the not so distant future, you have a local police force or a local governing body or a state governing body, or maybe a federal governing body that decides that they find some of your rights inconvenient. And so now they're going to utilize the police force they have. But by the way, by the way, when, when they take away all of our guns, are they, are they taking away the guns from the police too? No, of course not. Well, in some places they so, have. So, so keep in mind, keep in mind, they're not anti-gun. They're just anti you having a gun. They absolutely want the organizations and institutions which will be responsible for carrying out their orders to be armed and to be well armed, right? Okay, so now you live in a society where should you ever find yourself in a situation with, let's say, a corrupt police force, which last time I checked, leftists actually believed in, in such a thing as a corrupt police force. Or you had a state government, which was running rough trot over your rights, rough trot over your rights. Or you had a federal government that decided to do it. Well, now you don't have any means to defend yourself. And let me just remind everybody real quick that looks at 33,000 deaths a year in the United States, again, two thirds of them suicides, and says, that's a tragedy. I agree. That is absolutely tragic. But if the way that you're going to address that is by disarming everybody who isn't committing an act of violence, who, who has their firearms purely for their own protection, if you're going to disarm all of those people and you're going to leave them at the mercy of some future government that decides to not be quite as magnanimous as maybe the current one we have. Last time I checked, when it comes to body counts, governments don't have the best track record. And so if your trade-off right now is, well, yeah, we're going to have fewer, we're gonna, we're, we might have more stabbing murders, but we'll have fewer gun murders, right? Or we, we won't have as many mass shootings because obviously we, we've taken some of these guns away. That, we might still have mass killings. Maybe it's with poison. Maybe it's with explosives. Maybe it's with any number of things, but we'll have fewer. And that's what we want. And then one day in the future, you are confronted with a government that is willing to use force and coercion to deprive you of your rights, your liberties, your freedoms, your property, right? And now you're completely disarmed. Something tells me the body count is going to be significantly higher. That or your trade-off is you don't live in a free society anymore because you valued safety. And you really didn't even value safety. You valued certain kinds of safety. You value certain kinds of safety over other kinds. Right? If that's the sort of country that you want to live in, I got good news. Pretty much everywhere in the world fits that description. We're one of the few left that says no. It, when, we see, when we see violence on the rise, when we see these acts taking place, we are all about getting to the bottom of why that is happening and punishing that behavior and looking for ways to reduce those activities from taking place. But we're not going to do it at the expense of essential civil liberties because that's what it means to be in a free society. And if that is too scary for you, the world is full of places for you to go. But as I have said before, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this up with a bill that they're actually proposing in Virginia right now, House Bill 2, which, by the way, for everyone that has said, nobody wants to take your guns. We just want common sense gun control. The moment, the moment they got control of the House of Delegates and the Virginia Senate, what did they drop? They dropped a bill to criminalize you for possessing a whole host of semi-automatic rifles and pistols. Because that's now an assault weapon. Yeah, define semi-automatic real quick for folks that don't Semi-automatic is I they... pull the trigger once and the, the weapon fires once and then it reloads around. That's semi-automatic. I got to pull the trigger each time I want the rifle to shoot or the weapon to shoot every single time. He also made it a criminal act to own a magazine which holds more than 10 rounds. There's a whole host of, of legal semi-automatic pistols that come pretty standard with 15 round magazines right now. What's interesting is that there's been other versions of this bill that made it a felony. This one makes it a misdemeanor. There's been other versions that make it a felony. Guess what happens when you get a felony? They take your voting rights away. Yeah. They don't just take away your gun rights. They take your voting rights away. Yeah. And if you possess one of those things, it's not like you're grandfathered in. Like once they make this illegal, you're not grandfathered in. You have to give it up. It's there. It's not like oh, you already own these. That's okay. No. Well, and the you way have they, to give them up. And the way they get around this idea of gun confiscation. Oh no, no, we're not confiscating the guns. You're just obligated to destroy your own weapon system or, or render it inoperable. Oh, and, and what if I don't? Okay, so that it is gun confiscation. You're just requiring me to go and hand it in or me to destroy it rather than you destroying it. Yeah. 
It is gun confiscation. And then I got in a, a floor debate with uh, Delegate Mark Levine when he carried the version of this bill back in 2020, where he said, this won't affect law-abiding citizens. I'm like, oh, isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? You take a whole bunch of people who are currently law-abiding citizens, change the law on things they already owned or possessed, make them criminals and say, see, you're no longer a law-abiding citizen. That is exactly what they were doing. Well, I'd like to point out, you're no longer a constitutionally observing representative. What does that make you? Yeah. I want to back up real quick because a lot of times they will put forward things like red flag laws, which they already did in Virginia. Um, and they put it, it basically uh, like the media will tell, come out, you know, if Nick came out against red flag laws, which he is against, um, the media goes, oh, Delegate Freitas is against suicide prevention law. Yeah. And I, saw that. I just find that to be so disingenuous. I mean, it's, it's intellectually dishonest because the same, the very same people that want to couch all their gun laws in suicide prevention measures, they're the same people that think you should be able to go to the doctor and have them off you yeah. and have your insurance pay for it. So they're fine with suicide. They just want, you know, they just want to hand it. They, don't, they don't want you to do it yourself. It's not with a gun. What yeah. happens with a gun, so, it's tragic. So this whole suicide prevention aspect of it is all a bunch of garbage. It's not even, they don't even care. Like, I don't know why they care when on the other side, they're, they're trying to help people line up to go to doctors to have them off them. I want to do one more article here, and this has to do with, well, what about the UK and what about Australia? And I want to, I want to talk about this research because I actually mentioned it in, in that speech. And then I want to get to the, the super chats here. Opinion. I used to think gun control was the answer. My research told me otherwise by Leah Labresco. And she used to work for 538. I'm just going to read a part of this. Before I started researching gun deaths, gun control policy used to frustrate me. I wish the National Rifle Association would stop blocking common sense gun control forms, such as banning assault weapons, restricting silencers, shrinking magazine sizes, and all the other measures that could make guns less deadly. Then my colleagues and I at 538, which by the way, 538, more of a left of center think tank data analysis place spent three months analyzing all 33,000 lives ended by guns each year in the United States. And I wound up frustrated in a whole new way. We looked at what interventions might've saved those people in the case for the policies I'd lobbied for crumbled when I examined the evidence, the best ideas left standing were narrowly tailored interventions to protect subtypes of potential victims, not broad attempts to limit the lethality of guns. I researched the strictly tightened gun laws in Britain and Australia and concluded that they didn't prove much about what America's gun policy should be. Neither nation experienced drops in mass shootings or other gun related crime that could be attributed to their buybacks and bans. Now I want to say the reason why this is important is it's all about when you start counting the statistics, what you saw in places like UK and Australia was that their mass shootings were already massively on the decline. And that trend continued after they did it. Right. So it's not causation correlation. If it's already going there and I implement a policy here and it has no effect on the overall trajectory, I can't, I can't claim that policy is what caused it. All right, here we go. Neither nation experienced drop in mass shootings or uh, there you go. Yeah. Mass shootings were too rare in Australia for their absence after the buyback program to uh, be clear evidence of progress. And in both Australia and Britain, the gun restrictions had an ambiguous effect on other gun related crimes or death. So what does that mean? I took away one implement and because I didn't actually address the underlying conditions, you replaced, you just replaced one implement with another implement and still carried out your crime. When I looked at the other oft praised policies, I found out that no gun owner walks into the store to buy an assault weapon. It's an invented classification that includes any semi-automatic that has two or more features, such as a bayonet mount or a rocket propelled grenade launcher mount, which I, I've never walked into a gun store and seen something with that, a folding stock or a pistol grip, but guns are modular and any hobbyist can easily add these features at home just as if they were snapping together Legos. This is the other thing that is absolutely frustrating. And again, this is the part where Dan Helmer, who is the patron of this and who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, again, talks about like weapons of war, like I carried in Iraq. Really? Which weapon of war? They gave you a semi-automatic M4. Would you screw up? Because you should have had a semi-automatic with three round burst. I had a semi-automatic with full auto M4. So what was it? Was it the, was it the 92 FS? Was it your Beretta nine millimeter? That was the weapon of war. This is the other thing. It's the whole, what makes it an assault? So if it has a folding stock, it's now an assault rifle. If it has a pistol grip, it's now an assault rifle. That's just a different way to hold the weapon. That's it. 
Right, so all these people out here talking about assault weapons ban in their mind, what they're imagining is people walking around with a bunch of belt-fed machine guns. That isn't a thing. If that's what you think is going to stop this stuff, I got good news. There's already massive restrictions on that. Right, the average citizen cannot go by and, and buy anything like that. There's massive restrictions on where you have to store it, where you have to carry it. Like this idea that this is the problem, you don't know what you're talking about. Make, make it putting a putting a pistol grip on a rifle doesn't make it more assaulty. Putting a folding stock on a rifle doesn't make it more assaulty. By the way, nothing makes a weapon more assaulty because it requires a human being to actually engage in assault. I, I, I'll tell you what, let's let's pick something really scary, like a belt-fed machine gun. Let's let's pick an M240 Bravo, right? That was a belt-fed machine gun that I, I had in the 82nd Airborne Division when I was, a, that thing is a monster, it's a beast. It's considered a crew-served weapon. You had two people to, to operate it because one people holding the belt of ammunition and the other person actually pulling the trigger. Let's put that right here on this table with all the ammunition you want and let's see how many assaults it conducts. The answer will be zero unless somebody picks it up and decides to do that. This is just, again, you can read the, you can read the, the rest of it. Um, but this was somebody who, again, to this day still supports some forms of gun control. But what she found was is that when she looked at the evidence for what she was trying to research, it didn't pan out. And, and you actually saw a, a very recent article or a very recent study coming out of uh, Rand Corp that basically came to the same conclusion, that a lot of the most popular you know, gun safety measures don't actually achieve what they claim to. And, and again, the, the problem is, and this is the part that I want people to consider very strongly here for a moment, let's say they did. Let's say that all of these gun restrictions and all these gun bans actually achieved a, a significant drop in overall violence. Let, let's see that was actually achieved. Okay. The trade-off would be, the trade-off would be that at some point in the future, if the gun ban no longer worked, because again, you haven't addressed the underlying conditions leading to the criminal act. If it no longer worked, all of a sudden now you're not safer. Do you get your guns back? Or let's say sometime in the future, the government decides it is going to be oppressive toward you. Do you get your guns back? At what point in this measure do the people that implement these policies come back and say, oh my gosh, that didn't work the way we thought it would. We're sorry. Here's your guns back. Does that ever happen? No, it doesn't. Because I think there's a lot more motivating this than the idea that we just want a safer society. I do believe that there are people that are very concerned about the ability for citizens to not have to roll over and take it anytime the government comes up with a new bright idea. They don't like that. It makes them feel unsafe because they want the sort of society where people are docile and they just accept that the government knows what's best. We have the experts. Trust us. And if you don't get in line, it must be because you're a threat to our democracy. Because after all, that's how we decide what right or wrong is now, right? By voting. Great, if that's the sort of society you want to live in, call it whatever you want. It's not a free one. It's just not a free one. It's one where every right you have, all the property you own, everything is merely a privilege that the government can give or take away whenever it wants. And here's what you're going to find out. The government will be very selective on the laws it chooses to enforce and the people it chooses to enforce them against when you have no means to be able to defend yourself. And if you don't believe that, Take a look around the world right now. We still live in one of the freest law-abiding countries in the world if, if compared through time and history. And still, we see ample examples of a two-tier justice system. And that's one thing that left and right agrees on. We may disagree on the application. We may disagree on the best examples of it, but we're still seeing evidence of it. But no, 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 you go ahead and believe, you go ahead and believe that if you have no means to defend yourself, the government is only going to enforce laws, only going to implement and enforce laws, which makes sense for everybody. No, you're, you're going to find that if, if, you stop in, if you stop agreeing with the government and what their experts tell you, you're going to be punished for that. And again, anybody that tells me this is extreme or crazy or hyperbolic, I'm going to say you haven't been paying attention, not just for the last five years or 10 years, you haven't been paying attention to the last... 8,000 years of recorded human history. 
All right, let's go ahead and get to some of the super chats here. Isaac, thank you for the super chat. Bye, Isaac, really appreciate it. The price of liberty is virtue. The founding fathers founded this country and the constitution on the basis that the people here were virtuous people. I think that's interesting because you have two components to this. Um, you know, you have you have the old quote that if, if men were angels, no government would be necessary, right? And th this is a, a Madison quote. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Men are not angels, but then they also comprise the people within the government. And so you must compel the government to first control those aspects within society, which are important, but also control itself. And this is an important point that, that Bastiat used to make as well, is that, yeah, men are not angels, right? Humankind are not angels. And so, okay, if you're going to make the argument for government, you then have to come to the conclusion that, okay, one, and where will we pull these people that will now control the reins of government? Well, we're going to pull it from the same gene pool as everybody else. So it doesn't make any sense to assume that if people are not angels, the people in government will also not be angels. Um, and, and Adams also said that, you know, our constitution was written for a religious and moral, uh, people and is totally unsuited to any other. And he's, and he's correct. There's another quote. I can't remember who it comes from, but it, it basically, it basically warns that when society, uh, loses any sort of moral internal moral compass from which it can, you know, regulate its own behavior, you, you'll see a massive increase in the number of laws that seek to make up the difference. And it never works. It never works. If there isn't some sort of moral compass, which actually directs it, like positive moral compass, which directs your behavior, then, then no, no laws will be sufficient. And, and at a time where laws are increasing at the same time that the very people that complain about gun violence want to let people that commit acts of violence out of jail earlier because the system's corrupt, right? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That was another point that I brought up is I, I find it fascinating. The same people that want to lecture us on gun violence are the same people that are going in there advocating for, for people who have committed violent crimes to include those who have committed violent crimes of firearms to get out of jail earlier and go back into the society and go back into the, the communities that they often terrorized or victimized. Uh, dog face pony soldier. Thank you very much. When government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. Apocryphal, but great TJ quote. Yeah, it was. It, so it's one of those quotes that's attributed to Thomas Jefferson, but I don't think we have um, accurate um, attestation to, to prove that. But it, it does very much fall in line with Thomas Jefferson's overall uh, sentiment. Um, he was he was very adamant and very concerned about the, the growing influence and power of government. There's actually a really interesting... Um, it, again, it, it's it's a movie, right? But if you've never seen HBO's John Adams, I, I think it was one of the best series they ever did. And there's this really interesting exchange between Thomas Jefferson's character and Alexander Hamilton's character talking about the bank and the unintended consequences. And it's it's fascinating. Uh, Steve Sorensen, the truth is laws don't change the hearts of people. They reflect them. New laws won't stop murder or abortion unless we change hearts first. This is always interesting because I, I do believe that there are Obviously, I think the obligation of law is to um, reflect that which is morally correct. And that just begs the question, okay, so what is morally correct? Well, I'm, I'm a Christian. I know what I think is morally correct. Um, but one of the safest ways to kind of look at that is the idea of what I call non-voluntary human interaction. So I, I tend to be someone that there's all kinds of voluntary human interaction that to me would be in violation of the Bible, right? It would be considered sinful, but that doesn't necessarily mean there needs to be a civic law prohibiting it from taking place. Like a good example of this would be drunkardness, right? Like if you, if you're, you know, drunk all the time, biblically, that's a sin. I don't believe that the government necessarily should put you in jail if you're drunk all the time. Right? unless you then enter into the public and start engaging in an activity which deprives on the rights and liberties of other people. So that's what I mean by non-voluntary interaction. I do think laws which say if you are harming another human being by you're stealing from them, you're hurting them, you're, you're murdering them, whatever else it might be, laws are just which, which punish you for doing so. The problem that we get into is the whole preventative component right? It's, you, you see all these excess laws which says, well, we're going to pass this law in order to prevent this thing from happening. And that's the part where you start to see violations of, of you know, liberties or civil liberties. And that's not to say that all preventative law, excuse me, is bad, but it's something that we should be careful about. It's one thing to pass a law saying that this thing is illegal. And if you do this thing, it, it, you will be punished for it is another thing to say, this thing is bad. And we think these things lead to this thing. So we're going to make all of these things illegal too, which might not include you harming anybody else. And, and that's problematic. And that's where it goes into, you, you do have to, if there is not a, a cultural or societal, um, you know, code, which is 
doesn't need to be enforced by law because it's respected and appreciated within the society itself. No amount of laws are going to going to make up for that. And I think that's the point you're making. And I agree with CVA bug. Thank you for the super chat. Just tuned in. You may have covered this, but it feels like a repeat of 2019, 2020 mandate from the masses. VCDL lobby day could get interesting, but I sincerely hope it stays safe as always. This was what was so fascinating in 2020. The Democrats had control of the house, the Senate and the governor's mansion. They could, have, they could have had that bill signed into law. And that was a bill that was every bit as bad as this one. It started off as a felony. They moved it to a misdemeanor, but it would have banned a, a whole host of semi-automatic rifles, magazines, all of it would have criminalized it. And they had a governor that would have signed it. So what happened? 30,000 people descended on the Capitol in Richmond, many of them armed. They protested peacefully. They went around, they talked to people, they, they picked up their trash when they left to give you an idea. We've had, I, there was no, I think there was only one arrest and it was an anti-gun advocate, right? It wasn't, it wasn't the pro-gun people. So keep in mind, 30,000 people came. The, the Democrats lost their mind. They, they pulled uh, state troopers off the highway from all sorts of, of areas to where they couldn't police those areas. They brought down all this additional police and law enforcement, all this fencing, everything. The Capitol looked like they had set it up, like they were preparing for you know a, a, a coup. A siege. Right? Yeah. And what happened? Gun owners showed up. They protested. They talked. They picked up their trash. They left in peace. We've had more arrests on pro-abortion rallies where a few hundred people showed up then when 30,000 responsible gun owners showed up and that, that response combined with that out of the, I think it's, we have somewhere we have, I think we have just over 120 local jurisdictions. So that's counties, towns, cities, things like that. And I want to say it was somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred local jurisdictions had passed local resolutions saying that if this, basically if this law passes, we're not going to help you enforce it. We had sheriffs to include our, the former sheriff here in Culpeper County, Scott Jenkins, who stand up and said, I'm not enforcing this. In fact, he even went so far as to say he would deputize citizens so that they could legally carry. So a combination of all that, that local activity combined with the activity in Richmond caused the Virginia Senate to say, if we pass this, we're going to get crushed in the next election cycle. And they essentially kind of quietly killed it in a Senate subcommittee somewhere. Um, and it didn't go through. So if you've ever wondered whether or not you as a, as a citizen can have an impact on a bill that's going through, the answer is yes. But, but just as CVA Buck says, the reason why it was so successful is because 30,000 people showed up and no acts of violence. I, I, am, I am convinced that they were secretly praying that somebody would cook off a couple of rounds. I'm not saying they wanted somebody to get killed. I'm saying they wanted to be able to look at that and say, see, we told you so. You're all a bunch of violent people. You all just want to hurt people that don't that disagree with you. Why can't you be more tolerant? And this is why it had that happened, I can almost guarantee you, I, I think it would have had I think there would have been a different outcome. Yeah. We were we were actually concerned that somebody was going to show up from the other side and do something and then try to blame it on our side. Oh, we had people on the other side, uh, other legislators like terrified, like hiding during all of that. Oh, yeah. And they were like, Com Nick comrade. Freitas and his wife, Tina Freitas, have said things that, that are putting my life in danger. Yeah. And we're like, all we said is that, that was comrade you Carter. Like this bill. Like yeah. Well, Lee, Lee Carter got mad at me because, and, and look, I'll, I'll be fair to Lee. Poor um, me, Lee. I'll be, I'll, be to, I'll be fair to Lee Carter. Um, I, I, I kind of, I kind of, jibed him a little bit like, Oh, give over your guns. Well, that doesn't work out for the proletariat there, Lee. Uh, but it, like, I put it like it was a quote, like he had said it and he got mad at that. And, and you know what? That's fair. I understand that. I, that, that wasn't, that wasn't the right way to go about it. I'll accept responsibility for that. And I had somebody ask me like, well, Lee Carter says he doesn't support this. I said, well, we'll see because we just had a vote on the rules. And what did Lee Carter do? He voted for the rules, which essentially said you couldn't have a firearm anywhere on Capitol square. You can have it this. I said, so the first, the first chance he had to prove me wrong, he did it. Now on, on this piece of gun legislation, he did vote against it. So I'll, I'll give him credit for that. And he invited the socialist gun owners. Uh, what was it? The, the socialist gun owners association of America to show up. And I thought it was funny because again, I like to point out to Lee Carter, like, yeah, you guys are all for guns when you're, you know, seizing the means of production. But once you guys are in charge, you disarm the population pretty quick. I don't recall a lot of private gun ownership in the Soviet union there, comrade. All right. Dog face pony soldier. This video should be required viewing in civics classes. I would agree with that if I agreed with the idea of required viewing. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Isaac Gorski, you should have Brian Betts on. He is fun to debate. No, no, we, we appreciate Brian coming on. We don't have a we don't have a ton of guests on unless we're doing kind of like interviews, but uh, it's something we can consider in the future. Uh, the Shipbuilding Observer, what is funny about the musket argument? Oh yeah, we already we already addressed this one. Um, yeah, the fact that. Weapons technology was actually far more advanced um, in the late 1700s than, than most people, most gun control advocates think it was. Um, oh, gosh. Okay. Ix, Ix Chaz Man, Man, Manxel. I don't know. Dude, I butchered it. I'm sorry. Thank you for the super chat. You should talk about the absurdity that we should ban cops for killing people and ban guns at the same time. No, I, I, I do think it's <laughs> – this, this was a, an interesting point that we brought up is that the same people that are saying that – you know, um, you know, they want to ban guns and they want to ban cops, but they don't want to ban their own private security. Um, that's that's Chaz Man, by Chaz the way. Man? Oh, yeah, Chaz just Man. ignore the LX at oh, the beginning okay, and the XL yeah. at the end. Is yeah. There, yeah. 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 Um, but the, yeah, the people will get upset when, um, and this, this goes into the gun violence statistics again, right? If a police officer lawfully shoots somebody who was trying to kill them, that's a gun violence statistic. And, and so there, there, isn't a, there isn't a great deal of actually separating these things out and parsing them out to say, okay, can we, can we at least acknowledge legitimate ones from illegitimate ones? It's also amazing how the same, like, the same people that say, you don't need a gun because the police will protect you are also the one walking around spray painting, all cops are, you know, yeah. a cab uh, on the side of walls. So in, on one side, they can't imagine a world where the government would ever be oppressive toward the population. And then the next minute, they're saying that the United States government has reaped in nothing but patriarchal racism yeah. designed to hurt marginalized communities at the expense of us evil capitalists. Well, which is it, dude? <laughs> Which is it? Because chances are, if you really believe this about the government, if you really believe this about cops, why in the hell would you want to take away the guns from private citizens? That doesn't make sense. And it's because it's not supposed to. This is something that James Lindsay, um, we really, we're going to do a whole episode on some, some of the uh, work of James Lindsay. He's like, the issue is never the issue. The revolution is the issue. And they'll use whatever they need at that particular moment in order to garnish support for it. And if it's contradictory in the future, not only does that not hurt them, it helps them. Because you using logic is just a tool of the patriarchy. All right. Um, Micah Rockwell, Nick, can you speak on your beliefs on how a Christian should act in response to confiscation? Shooting my way out of it doesn't seem to be right. So Micah, here's what I'll say. Um, obviously when you, when you look at, uh, Romans, uh, Paul talks about, uh, respecting, uh, the, the political leaders that, that God has allowed to be put in place. Now, I think it's, it's important to actually look at a lot of that within the context of what was writing. However, that's not to say that there isn't application for that today. Um, one of the exceptions that is, that has generally been appreciated within the Christian church is that when a, when a society is engaging in laws, which are, Im, or is imposing laws, which are immoral, Right or causing you to engage in activity which uh, is, is contradictory to Scripture, that you don't have a, 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 a moral obligation to follow those laws. Right now, again, different people disagree on this. I'm not advocating that if they pass a gun law, you, you know, you take up arms and you and you overthrow the government. Right, that's that's not what I'm advocating. However, I don't intend to. If if all of a sudden I, I'm told that my AR-15 is illegal for me to possess. There are a number of peaceful ways that I cannot comply with that law, and I plan to make use of them because I do believe that that is a step in the path of a government attempting to impose itself uh, in a way that that violates essential civil liberties and, and I think is an immoral act, if not an unconstitutional one. And so I, I don't believe that I'm under obligation to essentially give up my right to be able to defend myself or my family Um you know, from a government or from anyone else. And so that's the question is that you're going to have to, you're going to have to study that and you're going to have to decide for yourself what you think is the best mechanism uh, for dealing with that law. And some Christians will come to the conclusion that they have to hand over their firearms. Others will come to the conclusion that there's peaceful means or maybe legal means in order to not comply with it. Um, but again, I'm not sitting here advocating violence against the government, but it is what it is. Now, if the government engages in violence against you, unlawful violence against you, tyranny, oppression, that is a that is a mechanism. I mean, there's a reason why we fought a revolution. All right, Curtis Horn. This is a similar situation as civil rights voting issue of the past. We need to make passing and enforcing laws that violate our civil liberties, including the 2A Criminal Act. 2A needs teeth now. So, Curtis, it, it's been interesting on, on how do you do that? Because obviously the way that you change the law Right? And there's, there's no aspect of the Constitution which can't be changed. We have an amendment process. So if someone puts forth an amendment to say to the Constitution or somebody says, my interpretation of the Constitution says that this particular law would be acceptable, 
we have a democratic process by which you can do that. And it would be, it would be hard to come up with a mechanism that would say, okay, it's illegal for you to carry this bill because at, at one point the second amendment was a bill, right? So the, the, the process for, for proposing um, legislation I think still needs to remain open, even if somebody's going to suggest legislation I don't agree with. If you make it illegal to carry a bill, which essentially uh, r- removes another law, well, I mean, that's that's problematic. And the moment where you say, well, no, I'm only talking about essential civil liberties, that's going to beg a larger question on, okay, what constitutes an essential civil liberty? And the moment you say, well, it's only these things, well, then now the government's going to go after everything else that you didn't qualify as an essential civil liberty. So I, I do think it's important that we be careful on the sort of mechanisms that we use. And ultimately, this is a cultural argument, right? The, the one thing I tell people is if you want to get people to not be scared of guns, take them shooting. I cannot tell you how many people that I've had you know, over to my house or taken to the range that had never fired a gun before, were kind of scared of them, wasn't really sure about this whole gun thing, and one day of shooting, and they are, they're like, where do I buy one? <laughs> right? Because you've taken the mystery and, and the terror away from it, and now you've, you've, you've taught them to respect it for what it is, a, a very effective and useful tool which can be used for good or ill. And if you want to be the sort of person that uses that tool for good, well, then you need to familiarize yourself with it and actually do it. So I would say one of the best ways to fight that cultural fight is to take away this mystery, this terror that is constantly being foisted upon people by the media, Hollywood, and anti-gun advocates. Uh, 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 Gosh, Dethined? Is it Dethined? I probably butchered that. Dethined. Um, When they told Australians to hand them in, there was many who said that they wouldn't be – that. They wouldn't, but in the end, the same people submitted to the government. Do you think the gun owners would do the same in America? Um, I think it's very different in America for two reasons. It's not to say that Australia didn't have something of a firearms culture. It, it clearly did. Um, but I, I, I would say that in the United States, and this is the big difference too, and, and, I, and I can't speak for Australia, so forgive my ignorance here, but like in the UK, the UK doesn't have a written constitution. When they refer to the constitution in the UK, it's more of the organization of their government, and then it's like longstanding traditions maybe within common law, but it's not the same as a written constitution in the United States, where not only do we have the federal constitution, which says, you know, with the Second Amendment, and, and has enumerated powers, but then within our state constitution, again, we have Article 1, Section 13, which provides additional protections for gun ownership. I think the other difference within the United States is that federal law enforcement and even state law enforcement doesn't possess necessary doesn't possess the necessary um, mechanisms for actually carrying it out. So in, in a lot of countries around the world, you have like these national police forces. In the United States, we have federal police forces, we have state police forces, but the vast majority of law enforcement takes place at a local level, either through sheriffs or um, town police or city police chiefs. What's unique about the sheriff is the sheriff is a constitutional officer. It is elected by the people and they usually serve at the county level in most jurisdictions. And what that means is that you have a law enforcement mechanism where you have a sheriff that recognizes their obligation to the constitution and may step in and say, I refuse to enforce this. And so what ends up happening is that even if they pass some of these laws, it can be unenforceable outside of a very, very narrow jurisdiction. And so that's really the question. Also, what you see in the United States is a lot of the laws that have passed um, grandfathered clause in existing weapon systems. Whenever you have a law that comes in that really challenges that and actually seeks to ban or confiscate existing ones, that's where you're going to see the ability to push back. And I think what you've seen in the United States, a lot of people push back by moving or they move their guns out of state or they're just a lot quieter about it. Or golly gee willikers, I lost all my guns on a fishing trip. How horrible. Well, again, if you have a local sheriff and a local commonwealth attorney or a local district attorney that isn't going to prosecute for that, well, now the law essentially becomes unenforceable unless the state or the federal government is willing to actually use resources to that purpose. And that's the part where I could actually see like a, a real, a, a real sticking point uh, with respect to federalism is one day if you ever have the Democrats packing the Supreme Court and then issuing a a a garbage ruling that the Second Amendment no longer protected an individual right, and they decided to use the ATF to go into Texas to confiscate weapons, I think you would see a situation where ATF shows up in Texas and is met by Texas Rangers that politely escorts them out of the state or something bad happens. And I hope it doesn't get to that, but that's the sort of mechanism that I could see playing out if they really did try to go with hardcore confiscation. Okay. Um, Mount Jotner, 
Hello from Montana, Nick. I have some of my foreign friends ask, what is the origin of our gun culture and why keep it around in modern day? How can I tell them to watch your content? Uh, and a guy named Kraut. Okay, so I don't know Kraut. Um, well, obviously, you can tell them to watch our content. That's pretty easy. You know, we have Making the Argument. We have our, our stuff on uh, Instagram. It, pretty much if you if you go into Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and you type in Nick J. Freitas, our, our content's going to be there. We're also it looking- It didn't say how can I tell them. It just said- I can now. Oh, tell I can now them. tell. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, so sorry. Thank you, <laughs> Tina. Um, so yeah, you can do that. And, and again, we're we're happy to kind of explain that in, in greater detail on, on why there is a gun culture. And I would argue that it's it's not so much. Yes, guns are a part of it, but I wouldn't describe myself as a gun collector. Uh, there are some people. I have friends that are. They're gun collectors, and and they love doing that. Um, for me, it's more of an essential civil liberties component. It's the idea that I want to live in a free society. I want to be able to perpetuate a free society. And I think a, a part of that is free citizens being able to both, again, as our Second Amendment implies uh, or, or says directly, either form as a militia to be able to protect our civilization from uh, a foreign threat or to be able to protect ourselves from a domestic threat. And so- Can, can I bring something up real quick yeah. from, uh, from the regular chat? Um, City Homestead said, I'm disabled, but- also a felon. What am I to do in this crazy world? Hide in my vault. And, um, I just wanted to mention, uh, don't most States have a process for having your rights restored? Yeah, after? Th there is a process for restoration of rights. And, and I, I will say this, there are, when, when someone is a felon I, and look, I'll just be blunt here. When someone is convicted a violent act against another human being, I understand the, the suspension of either their Liberty or certain rights. Um, I do. And, and some people say that, well, if it can be taken away, it's not a right. That's not true. If someone murders you, they took away your right to life, right? So there are conditions on which, you know, rights can be suspended. Um, and, and there can be appropriate ways in which that is done, especially if, if someone has committed acts of violence against uh, another innocent or peaceful person. I don't know your circumstances. There are things that are felonies, which I don't think should automatically include a, a loss of your, your shooting or your gun rights, uh, or maybe even a loss of your voting rights, depending on the circumstances. But there is a process in, in every state in order to go for a rest, uh, a restoration of rights for voting rights and for gun rights. We have that in Virginia. Um, and so I, I would, I would involve looking at that and, and what that process looks like. Like, obviously, if, if, if there was a crime committed, say, like in your early 20s and now in your 40s and 50s and um, you've served your time, you've paid your restitution to and, you know anybody that might have been owed it um, and you've lived in peace, there, there's usually a, a, a fairly straightforward mechanism for making the argument for restoration of rights. We also have a, a group here in Virginia. Um, there's an attorney named uh, Graven Craig, if you're in Virginia, and they've done a lot of work on, on defending second, uh, second amendment rights. They've also done a lot of work with respect to restoration of rights in, in appropriate circumstances. So that's something I, I would yeah. encourage you to look into. It's definitely, um, also something you could probably talk to your representative about if you're, if you're getting blocked a lot and you're really trying to get through a lot of times your representative can help you navigate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reach out to you, reach out to your rep too if if you got a good one. <laughs> Some are more helpful than others. Uh, Gun Griffin said, "I don't advocate for violence, but Captain Parker said if they want war, let it begin here. For the same reason on the bridge at Lexington, as Henry said, uh, that's Patrick Henry. Uh, give me liberty or or give me death. There again, I get asked this question a lot. What once what is the point where it goes beyond civil disobedience, and, and where where is there sufficient moral justification? And and look, I wish I had a better answer for people on that one. What I will say is that I, I do believe that when a government becomes so tyrannical and, and the way the way tyranny was described uh, with respect to the Revolutionary War and, and the justification for independence, tyranny was described as. Um, or, or tell me the, the example there, if you look through the Declaration of Independence, we actually did a whole episode on what they don't tell you about the Declaration of Independence, because all you hear is taxation without representation. No, there were 27 grievances that were specifically listed out as justification for independence. And what it really, what it really made an argument for was that King George had reached a point where they had, they had gone to so many different things to completely not only violate what they were considered to be rights as British citizens, but what were considered to be the processes whereby civil disputes were adjudicated. So a lot of it had to do with the manipulation of what was considered the, the normal good order of the legislative process or local control 
um, or the judicial process. All of those were listed as examples. And then on top of that, there was the, the deployment of the military in order to force compliance with things like the intolerable acts. So it wasn't just taxation without representation. It was a number of things. And then, yeah, the, the, the point where it really kicked it off was gun confiscation, right? It, it was, it was the, um, the British army coming to confiscate, um, uh, storage munition storages and arm storages for the militia at Lexington and Concord. So there was a lot of things that led up to it, but that ended up being the the linchpin, right? That was the catalyst. So we always talk about there's conditions and then there's catalysts. The conditions were the intolerable acts. The conditions were the the executive branch of the British government essentially running roughshod over uh, over traditions, history, rights, etc. And then that, that catalyst, which really just uh, uh, kind of created a, a certain point of no return, was the shots fired at Lexington and Concord. But it's important to understand that we hadn't even declared, we had, we had formed a Continental Army, had fought at Bunker Hill, um, had fought at New York before we had declared independence, right? There, there was, the initial fight was still the restoration of what the founders considered to be their rights as British citizens, and then it got to a point where when they, they sent the olive branch petition over to the English crown and the olive branch petition was, and this is when hostility was actively taking place. I don't think people appreciate this. Hostility was actively taking place. The olive branch petition was sent as an, as a last ditch attempt to try to reconcile the British government with its colonies in America. And King George's response to that is what essentially gave the pro independence portion of the um, Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress, um, that's what gave them the ammunition they need to basically pull over um, Pennsylvania, South Carolina into the pro-independence camp and to get New York to move toward neutral status initially and then to sign on to it later. And that's that's where you got independence. So, hey, over in Rumble, uh, Royo 2 Row says that's a why minute episode right there. Why does America have a uh, gun coat? That would be, that would be a good yeah. one. Uh, Tux Peng, first time listening live. Don't really have much to say. It's nice to see someone on YouTube who makes sense. Well, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for the super chat. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate the interaction with the audience. It's one of the reasons why we do the live. I mean, we, we love that. Uh, Curtis Horn again, Nick, I agree with you. What I'm saying is we build on the civil rights act and expand it. The government is going after rights anyway. Why not severely restrict what bills local lawmakers can pass? So that's a good point. And this is the, this is the distinction between local, state, and federal. Now, in Virginia, we have something called the Dillon Rule. Now, in some ways I like it, in some ways I don't. We're one of five states that have the Dillon Rule. And what the Dillon Rule states is that all localities, the power of a local government is derived from the state, which means localities cannot pass laws or ordinances however they want. They have to first get authority from the state to do so. Now, what that generally provides for is continuity across all of your local jurisdictions. So you don't have one county doing one thing, another county doing a separate thing. And that could be good unless, of course, the state is mandating bad things be done all across the state. And then the Dillon rule gives them the power to do that. In other states, which are home rule states, localities have more authority to pass individual ordinance or laws, but they can't do anything which violates the state constitution because the state constitution has supremacy over local rules and ordinances. Right now on the federal level, people will talk about the supremacy clause within the constitution. We did a whole episode on this. What they need to understand is the supremacy clause doesn't mean if the federal government does it, it's law or, or it has supreme authority. What it means is, is that in, in so far as a power has been enumerated to the federal government, then the laws issued in faithful carrying out of the, the responsibilities associated with that law that has supremacy. Right. So, so that's the proper understanding of the supremacy clause. But again, I, I get what you're saying and, and I get, it's this whole idea that if we have, um, if it violates the, the bill of rights, then a local ordinance or a state can't pass it. And we do have that. And that's what ends up happening is somebody passes. But the question is, is how do you know it's violated that civil liberty? Well, it has to go through a judicial process. And that's why we've had bills go all the way up to the Supreme Court and been struck down by the Supreme Court. So we do have something of a process in that. It's just very, very difficult to write it in such a way that wouldn't allow the other side of this debate to engage in a whole lot of mischief. Right? And that's what we need to, that's what we need to understand any sort of additional power that we create within the state, even if it's a power to say you can't carry that legislation because it violates civil liberty, right? 
all of a sudden that now becomes a tool which can be used against you. Yeah. And that's what we need to be careful. You, you of. have to take it to its logical conclusion yeah. and, and consider how the, your, the other side could exploit whatever you're considering new law wise. Yeah. Ace of spades. Thank you very much for that super chat. That's very generous. I can't watch at the moment. I'll listen after I get off of work. Just want to say, love what you do. And thank you. Here's a gift from me to you guys. Happy holidays. Ace of spades. Thank you very much. We, we really appreciate that. Um, you know, we, we've always, we've always kind of made it an object to, to, you know, put stuff out there and, and to, to do it for free because we, we want to do this in a way that, that helps people. And, um, and, and we just, we get a lot from the community in the chat, but when people are willing to come in and voluntarily support us, um, it, it means a lot to us it really does. And so I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Uh, Gun Griffin, again, wish the right would stop saying we need a revolution. That's leftist talk. What we're really demanding is a restoration of what the founders envisioned. Gun Griffin, that is a really good point. Um, you know, there, there's a there's a very interesting debate on what actually constitutes a revolution. In fact, some people have even said that the American Revolution wasn't a revolution; it was actually a departure, um, because what they were essentially what they were first fighting for was a restoration of rights. And when that was no longer possible, that's when they fought for separation in order to create a new government. And so it's it's interesting to consider what what exactly falls within the definition of a revolution. But I, I think you bring up an interesting point. Um, uh, Evie, 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 Evie. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so bad at this. When will you run for president? Never. Well, thank you very much. But <laughs> I, I don't think that's where I could be of the most value. Uh, look, I've, I've served in the Virginia general assembly for eight years. I just got reelected to a second, uh, two year or to a, my fifth two year term. Um, we'll see how much longer I do it. I, I'm someone that doesn't believe that politics necessarily should be a career. Um, I, I love the fact that we have a citizen legislature in Virginia. The federal government is obviously not a citizen legislature because in the sense that it's, it's professional. It's a full-time job. Um, I've run for federal office before because I, I thought I could be of value. Uh, and, and I didn't get, I didn't win. I didn't win my election. Um, and uh, here's all I'll say is that politics, I, I was always, I've always been interested in politics. I've always been involved on some level, but it was, it was never the driving force behind what I thought my career would be. And I, I especially never, um, it, I didn't automatically assume that I would one day be an elected official. Um, and it, and it, look, it's been an honor to serve in the capacity that I have. And it was an honor to be asked to serve in other capacities, but it, it's, it's not a part of my life goals. Um, insofar as I think I can be of service, I, I will, it's something I will consider. And insofar as I don't, I won't consider it. And I, I can tell right now I have zero desire, um, to, to ever run for something like that. It's incredibly difficult. Um, just not, Something I want to do. Tina's telling me to wrap it up. I'm boring people. All right. Let's <laughs> There's go more to super chats and we're going uh, along. Bahai Sandor. Uh, thank you very much. Nick, in a situation where one is attacked with a stick and responds with a gun, how do we assess the moral balance between self defense and excessive force? Also, thank you for this awesome live. That is a great question. And, and here's what I want to say we see this a lot with respect to countries talking with one another about a proportional response. Here's what I will tell you. Insofar as you fear for your life, if somebody attacks me with a stick and I fear for my life and I shoot them, that was a proportional response because I didn't engage the aggressive act. I, I didn't engage that. You did. And if you decide that you're going to threaten me or threaten my family, I'm going to use whatever force I think is necessary to stop the threat. Now, hopefully you can do that in a way that doesn't lead to the loss of human life. But if it does, that is the, the moral quandary I don't think exists because my job, my obligation at that point is to defend myself, defend my family. And I don't need to, if you come at me with a stick, I'm not going to go get a stick so we can fight Marquis of the Queensberry rules. I'm going to go grab a gun and I'm going to tell you to stop because the gun is more likely to get you to voluntarily stop. If I show up with a stick, you might think you can take me. If I show up with a gun, you might say this was probably a bad idea. So the gun, the presence of the gun in that moment actually increases the probability that violence will not take place, right? So it can actually serve a very positive function. But if you, if you insist, now I'm going to think you're crazy because I got a gun. Now, if there's a way that I can potentially stop you without killing you, maybe I will do that, but I'm under no moral obligation to do so. So I, I think the, I think what's more important for people to understand is that when we insist on proportional response, you're actually giving an advantage to the attacker. Because the attacker already has the advantage because they know when and where they're going to attack. You having to defend yourself actually puts you in a disadvantage. So using a firearm to defend against someone with a knife or a stick or a club or a bat or wherever else it might be, I don't think there's a moral problem there. You're going to have to analyze your own situation to be able to decide whether or not you think you can effectively navigate this without maybe killing somebody. 
Um, but I think it gets really problematic in law where now we're, we're telling judges or we're telling juries to say, well, did he really need to shoot this guy three times? I don't know if he was, if he was minding his own business and got attacked and needed to shoot three times in order to stop him. My inclination is to side with him because he wasn't the one initiating the act of violence. He was responding to it, right? Cause the first initial act of violence is not the gunshot going off. It's somebody engaging in a threat towards somebody oftentimes like on their property or, or whatever it might be. Well, in a situation like rape, yeah. What are you going to do? Like, well, they're attacking you with a stick of sorts. What are you <laughs> supposed to attack them back with? Yeah. And my, my whole thing with the second amendment has always been that women should carry women should know how to, how to handle a gun. They should, they should carry. And, um, the left constantly wants to talk about rape culture and, um, and what a huge threat rape culture is to women. Well, I don't see any threat whatsoever if I'm armed. At all. And so I always say that, you know, to deal with your rape culture, you have more would-be rapists, you know, bleeding out in a gutter somewhere. And yeah. I, I'm absolutely perfectly fine with a rapist paying with his life for trying to assault me with his stick. Yes. <laughs> now, if somebody, now look, if somebody comes onto your property, threatens you, you, you brandish your firearm and they leave, and now you get in your car and you chase them down the street and, and shoot them up. Yeah. No. Okay. That that's problematic, right? Because now the, the threat has been neutralized and you've continued to, to, you know, hunt them down. So I, I think we can make very, very clear cut distinctions in those situations. But uh, again, there's, there's a real simple solution for this. If you're so, if you're the sort of person that wants to engage in aggressive violence against an innocent person, you should know that at least in this country, you run the risk of getting shot 12 times. And, and we're not only are we not going to hurt the person that did it, we're going to reward them and thank them for getting rid of somebody that was committing acts of violence. Okay. Uh, Hillbilly Samurai. I <laughs> love that name. Why ban certain weapons from all people when we should ban all weapons from certain people? So that's, a, that's an interesting discussion. And the idea is, is that in most states in, in the country, you will lose gun rights if you're a felon, especially if you commit a violent felony with a firearm. And again, I, I think it's reasonable to say, yep, you commit a violent felony. You, you have proved that you're a danger to another person. You've uh, attacked the innocent. Yes, we're going to take away your means from being able to do that more effectively in the future. We're not going to take away the means of the person that got attacked from being able to defend themselves. And so I think that's a very good distinction between the two things. It's like, are we punishing the criminal or are we essentially punishing the victim? And when this person creates a victim out of another human being and you say, well, our solution here is we're going to ban the victim from being able to have easier access to a firearm, that doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. Uh, now, there's additional questions on how should this apply to things like mental health? If you are on certain drugs, if you're on certain antidepressants, should you be denied your Second Amendment rights? And the issue that we look on that is, okay, we can understand that maybe uh, certain mental conditions or certain health conditions could lead to you losing rights. The problem is, is does that diminish your desire? desire to go and seek help for those issues, right? So, so those are some of the things that we need to look at. What I would say is that my standpoint, my position tends to be that if you have not, you know, violated the law, then I'm, I'm not going to deprive you of rights that might be associated with those violations. Um, you simply having the propensity to violate the law, that's, that's a very, very dangerous area because you can see very easily how someone would then broaden that definition. Oh, you're dealing with depression? Well, now we have to take away your Second Amendment rights because you might use a firearm to kill yourself. Right, you're already seeing kind of hints of this when the VA starts to ask questions like, do you have any guns in your house? Okay, why is that any of your business? Or if they say, well, it's because you're depressed or because of this or because there's a high propensity or because of red flag. Now, all of a sudden, you could see how somebody who is not being honest would use that additional information in order to deprive someone of their rights, even though they haven't committed any crime, nor do they intend to, nor they would be of high propensity to. And so that's where, again, it becomes difficult when we're, when we're looking at this from a legal perspective. CVA Buck, thanks again, man. Uh, how do you feel about lowering the bar for petition of grievances? For example, a writ of uh, mandamus is prohibitively expensive for most people, thus precluding the ability to address rights violations without aid from nonprofits. Um, so the, the, the writ of mandamus, and again, I am not an attorney. So writ of mandamus, as I understand it, is I, I think it's requiring someone to uh, appear for a, a redress uh, before a court. I, I believe that's what it is, but correct me if I'm wrong. Again, I'm, I'm telling you right up now, I'm not an attorney. I don't know. Um, so when we look at uh, the petition for grievances, I, I think the the issue that we're going to get into, um, I, I think it should be relatively easy for someone to be able to adjudicate issues within court. The problem is, is that when your court system becomes overwhelmed, um, 
there's the issue of what we might consider to be frivolous lawsuits. So obviously there are attorneys and there are people that are overly litigious that are constantly trying to take people to court and that creates a, a burden on them. So I would say that the only way that I think that we could effectively do that, and, and you're starting to see this in certain places, I don't think it's necessarily tort reform. Right, A lot of people push tort reform, which is essentially to say that, okay, yeah, you can sue someone, but we're going to limit the damages that you can actually get so we don't have like these incredible awards um, that don't make any sense. The problem is, is that now we start to get into this battle of, okay, well, if, if you go into a hospital and they, they accidentally take off the wrong leg, how much is that worth? Is it worth $2 million? Is it worth 500000 Like, what is it? I think the better argument is there needs to be a penalty for people engaging in litigious lawsuits. And that's the sort of idea that when it has been determined that, or excuse me, not litigious, but frivolous, when someone is engaged in a frivolous lawsuit, an obviously frivolous lawsuit, can there be penalties for that? Can there, can the other party now sue for damages? And again, there's difficult legal questions in there because you can always imagine ways that could potentially be violated or abused. And so I, I'm, I'm certainly open to the idea. I just think we need to be prepared for not only how good people are going to use it, but for how bad people are going to use it as well and hopefully put in the, the right criteria in there so we don't create you know, an, an additional incentive for, for bad actors. And again, I, I apologize on the, uh, the writ of mandamus if I got that wrong. Okay, uh, MT Jotner, once again, thank you. Similarities to your Dillon Law, 2020, weed became legal for recreational use in Montana. The state let the counties decide if they were going to be a dry or sell county. You can, Yeah, so one of the things with a, a Dillon rule is, the again, in Virginia, the, a local, let me, let me back up. In most states, provided that there is no state law against, we'll say, marijuana use, a local jurisdiction could then say, we want to have a law that does prevent it, or we want to have a law that does allow it or sets up a retail market. In a Dillon rule state, whether there's a law or not, the locality cannot do it unless the state has issued them the proper authority to be able to, to address it. All right, so that, that's kind of the difference between a home rule and a Dillon rule state. Now, in a Dillon rule state, we can still give local options. So for instance, not every locality in Virginia has a bee pole tax or has a um, uh, you know, uh, occupancy tax or whatnot. Sometimes you can authorize a locality to do it or a lo lo <laughs> locality can petition for the right to do it or the authority to do it, I should say, uh, but the state doesn't have to grant it. All right, is that the last... Super chat. All right. All right. Listen, we, we went a little bit longer than I thought we were going to on this. So I'm, I'm going to wrap it up right now. I want to thank everybody. I, I think we kind of hit all these issues to death, but so I'll, I'm going to sum up here very quickly. Ultimately, what this is about for anybody watching, especially in a foreign country that is trying to figure out why are Americans so obsessed with guns or not? We are obsessed with essential civil liberties. And we're obsessed with our ability to be able to protect ourselves, to be able to protect a free society. And the reason why the Second Amendment was put into place and the reason why you have so many corresponding amendments in state constitutions is because we recognize the, the absolute essential nature of free people to be able to defend themselves from domestic threats, from foreign threats, and yes, at times from their own government. And if you want a good representation of this, I want you to think about the number of people that grew up in Jim Crow states that were actively discriminated against based off of their color, who couldn't rely on law enforcement to show up to protect them, who had to take matters into their own hands to be able to protect their communities. It hasn't been that long ago since this was necessary within the United States. And so anybody that pretends that this is all part of a, a bygone past that we don't have to worry about anymore is not a very good student, not only of ancient history, but of fairly recent history. And yes, I understand that there are countries out there that have implemented pretty draconian gun laws and they've seen a decrease in gun violence, but we need to ask what was the overall decrease in violence itself? Who were the number of people that might have become victims that wouldn't have become victims had they not been deprived the right of the tools to be able to defend themselves? And ultimately what we are talking about is a larger trade-off within society. If you want to live in a free society, well, there's no such thing as a free society where the citizens themselves are not capable of being able to defend themselves. Ultimately, that is just a society that is living off of a series of privileges that have been issued to them by their government and can be taken away at any time. This is a defining characteristic of a free society, and nobody's ever going to convince me otherwise, and nobody is going to get me to comply with the sort of laws that would actually disarm people and turn them into subjects rather than citizens. So whereas I advocate for peaceful interaction with your government in order to convince those representatives to make sure that they are upholding your civil liberties, your naturally God-given civil liberties, not privileges by government, 
I also think that people have a right to be able to defend themselves. And ultimately, that is what this is about. And if we really want to stop mass shootings, if we really want to stop the problems associated with inappropriate and immoral gun violence, well, then we better start asking ourselves what the motivation is behind the sort of violence that is taking place, especially the violence that has been directed toward children. Because I will tell you this much, if you take away the guns without addressing that, you're just going to get a different type of violence taking place within our schools. And I don't think you're going to make anyone safer by disarming millions of people that have done nothing wrong. If your civil liberties are completely dependent upon what somebody else does with theirs, then you don't have them. They're just privileges. So that's what this is ultimately about. And that is why we care so deeply about this issue. It's not because we don't believe it is tragic when somebody abuses their rights. We just think it's absurd that everybody else should give up their rights when somebody abuses theirs. Let's put the attention on where it belongs. The people committing acts of violence, not the people that simply want to live in peace with the capacity to defend themselves in a free society. All right. Thank you very much for joining us this episode. I know this is a, this is a kind of a heavy one. I hope that the information that we've given, that the arguments that we presented are uh, properly equipping you to be able to have productive conversations with people that might be open to a different way of thinking on this, but just haven't considered all the facts that we've brought up today. So hopefully this equips you. And once again, thank you very much to Good Ranchers for having the courage to defend and to sponsor and to ad- advertise with a podcast like ours. You want to do, you want to support us. One of the best ways you can do it, go there to goodranchers.com. Use promo code Nick. Get your something great. Get yourself something great for your family uh, for the holiday season and support us at the same time. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next episode.